Good evening and welcome to tonight's City Council meeting, August 17th, 2015. I'm glad that those of you that are here were able to make it out today. I'm calling the meeting to order. I'd like to uh, ask the clerk to uh, call the roll, please. Councilman Amador? Present. Councilman Teeter? Here. Councilwoman Carson? Present. Councilman Benson? Here. Mayor Ford? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Bullock? Here. Councilman McElDowney? Here. Councilwoman Elliott? Present. And Councilman Douglas? Present. And you have a quorum. Thank you. I want to make the record known that all of the council members are present this evening. And I'd like to invite the audience to uh, stand up and join me in a moment of silence, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Now I'd like to ask the staff to go around, pass the microphone, and allow the audience to introduce themselves. Norma Portnoy with Kids First Healthcare. Maria Zubia with Kids First Healthcare. Eddie Thomas. Danny Thomas. Marty Flom, Observer. Guillermo Serna. Carolyn Keith, Parks and Recreation. Kathy Blakeman, Human Resources. Chris Kramer, Community Development. Carmen Luna, Resident. Doug Heinemann with Information Technology. Ben, Wolf ben Wolfersberger. Dana Wolfersberger. Allison Wolfersberger. Rachel Wolfersberger. Armando Guardiola, Finance. Rebecca White, Colorado Department of Transportation. Mike Shirotis, High Performance Transportation Enterprise. Tony DeVito, Colorado Department of Transportation. All right, thank you all for being here. Let me turn the microphone back on so you can hear me. Thanks again for being here. We're going to start our meeting off with a proclamation. I'd like to ask Norma Portnoy and Maria, please come up to the podium. Um, Bob? Well, first, we have the uh, proclamation. I want uh, Bob to go ahead and read that proclamation. Commerce City, Colorado, proclamation. Whereas there are 43 community safety net clinics known as CSNCs, including Kids First Health Care and 51 federally certified rural health clinics known as RHC, located in 41 counties throughout Colorado. And whereas these clinics were created by civic minded individuals, healthcare professionals, and systems, churches, and other community organizations who recognize, despite the presence of other safety net providers in their communities, there are many individuals, children, and families still in need of timely access to healthcare services. And whereas Colorado's CSNSCs and RHSs provide essential health care treatment and preventive services through an estimated 1,125,000 visits to approximately 344,000 Coloradans annually. And whereas clinics like Kids First Health Care are safety net providers to people and communities in need serving the uninsured, underinsured, or those insured through public programs relying on complex and vulnerable funding streams to create innovative solutions that deliver patient-centered, high-quality care in an efficient and effective manner. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the City Council of Commerce City declares August 17 through 21 
2015 as Safety Net Clinic Week, expressing our gratitude to Kids First Healthcare and other facilities for their time, energy, and commitment to provide essential health care services to this community and underserved populations throughout Colorado. In witness whereof, I have here on the my hand and caused this seal to be affixed on the 17th day of August 2015. City of Commerce City, Colorado, Sean Ford, Mayor. Okay, thank you, Bob. Before I ask for a motion, I would just like to say, first of all, thank you to you, you two ladies, and, and not just you, but all of the providers out there. Um, however, Kids First and the things you're doing in our community to help the kids that are, are, are in our school systems um, to be healthier and not affect other kids, it, it's amazing, and it, it's really a tribute um, to the two of you for the efforts you put in um, to making sure that we have a healthy young community. And I, I want to praise you for your efforts. Does anybody else have any comments you want to make before I call for a motion? Seeing none, I'm open for a motion. Mr. Bullock. Move. Move to approve the proclamation. Thank you. Mr. McEldowney. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the proclamation. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Motion is carried. Now I'm going to uh, give you two ladies the floor, and then we're going to come down and take some pictures. So um, go ahead. Sure. Well, we, uh, we were founded in 1978 with the belief that all children deserve access to health care, high quality, easily accessible health care. So we serve about 3,000 children a year, and since 1978 we've served over 58,000 children with over 149,000 health care visits. Uh, and we are having an open house this Wednesday on behalf of Clinic Next Safety Week, and if you can stop by, we'll show you at least one of our clinics. Uh, we have five in Commerce City. So we, we're just appreciative of this proclamation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Maria, did you have anything you want to say? No, I just wanted to echo what uh, Norma said and invite anyone who is interested to come and learn more about our centers. Um, so we do have an open house in Commerce City uh, in the afternoon, well, morning, 1130, I believe, on Wednesday. There's some invitations that were handed out to council already. Um, so please do come by if you can or um, if you'd like to uh, give our information to someone else so that they can learn more about our programs, we'd appreciate it. But thank you all, and, um, and it's great serving in this community. We know the need is out there, and um, we're here for any child birth to 21. Right. Thank you, and uh, just stay there. We're going to come down and take a picture. If council, join me down front, please. We're going to go into our citizen communication portion of our meeting. That's cool. And as we approach the election season, council would like to remind all candidates for election uh, for elected offices that political activity in city buildings is prohibited per resolution 2008-60. This includes campaigning from the podium. When I call your name, please come forward. You have uh, three. You need to state your name and address for the record need to keep comments limited to three minutes. So first I'm going to call uh, Tony DeVito.
Good evening. Good evening, Mayor, members of the City Council. Uh, my name is Tony Dale. I am the I-70 East Project Director. Just uh, on behalf of CDOT, I want to thank you. I was on mute. Yeah, you Sorry go. about that. Could you hear me? Yep. All right. So um, I just want to, on behalf of CDOT, thank you guys uh, for allowing us to come up here as part of our uh, week of open house and roadshow as we're talking about the I-70 East project. A uh, project you're very familiar with. Uh, you've been a, a longtime supporter of the project. Uh, many, many, some of you, I think, were part of the PACT, the Preferred Alternative Collaboration Team, back in uh, um, 2011, 2012, when uh, we kind of put our heads down to try and come up with an uh, alternative all of us could get our arms around. But that didn't happen at that time. But uh, we're excited now that we're reaching milestones uh, with an identified preferred alternative that will be um, identified in the final EIS come January. Uh, so we're approaching some critical milestones, uh, kind of a parallel path with uh, the NEPA process. Um, we're also looking at a procurement process. Uh, we've been out for statements of qualifications. Uh, we received qualification submittals from five teams. We've shortlisted that down to four. Uh, in about a month, we start um, a very long eight-month process so for the request for proposals. Uh, it's an iterative, 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 sorry about that, uh, in this draft process. We'll be uh, communicating back and forth with uh, the, the teams as we develop this. And uh, we just always, uh, as in the past, thank you for your support and getting us to this identified alternative. And uh, here for any questions. All right, thank you. Um, I first want to thank you very much for coming out and having uh, one of these meetings here at Commerce City City Hall so that our residents have access to the information. Um, as to what's happening and where the process is at. Um, Mr. McElroy, you have comments? Yes. No? Um, does anyone on the council have any comments for Mr. DeVito at this time? No? Again, Tony, thank you very much thank for coming you. out. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. All right. And we have another one from CDOT. Mike? Mike Sherotis. Uh Good evening to you. Uh, good evening, Council. My name is Mike Sherotis. I'm the director of the Colorado High Performance Transportation Enterprise, which is a small unit within CDOT that deals with financing projects that CDOT decides uh, it either wants or needs to do. Um, we are involved with the, with the I-70 East project because it is being procured uh, in uh, a public-private partnership model. Uh, we are looking for, as Tony explained, uh, a partner who will come in, design, build, finance, operate, and maintain the project. That last part is, is quite important. Um, I think CDOT has taken the view lately that it's, it's important not only to find a way to finance uh, projects themselves, but it, we need to find a way to make sure those projects are maintained and rehabilitated over time so that we don't run into the same problems over and over and over again. Glad to be here. Glad to answer any questions uh, you'd like. This project will include a, uh, a managed lane, uh, which will be a uh, reliable travel time lane for people who use that road during peak periods. Um, uh, you know, it's a piece of the project that we, we're going to have to get out and explain to people and make sure everybody understands exactly how that's intended to work and why we're doing it. So I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm happy to talk to anybody who wants sure. to. Uh, I, I have one comment that I'd like to make, and I think on Commerce City's end, um, and, and not speaking for all the council, but um, I think that we're happy with it staying on alignment, being improved where it's at, where we want to see... Um, those those uh, massive overpass areas that would protect some of the neighborhoods, but on Commerce City's end, and I can't I can't not say this, and and I, I wish I would have said something while Tony was up here. We're concerned when when we do get to the point of construction of I-70 East corridor, that 270 is going to handle a ton of extra traffic, and it's not in very good shape. And want to make sure that as the state's moving forward on the I-70 IEIS program for, for the, the new road to go in, that you're also thinking about what these alternatives are going to look like during the, the term of the construction, um, because 270 is in terrible shape, especially through Commerce City, 
and I want to make sure that if we're going to put that additional traffic on there, we try to get some improvements to handle that additional traffic um, so that we're not dealing with a major problem once we start getting some of that I-70 traffic while construction is going on. I, th I think that's uh, the focus of considerable attention inside uh, CDOT. Sure, and, I, and I'm sure it's on their mind, but given the opportunity to say something about Commerce City, making sure that we get 270 fixed before we get that traffic is important <laughs> to the people watching at home and the people in this audience, and especially Mr. Cerna, who's in the back. So I had to, I had to get uh, my two cents in there. <clears throat> yeah, go ahead. Um, so a big critical part of this uh, RFP will be what we call management of traffic. Um, since we're under what's right now about 30% design, um, we, we kind of formulated as engineers, we can't stop thinking about how to build stuff at times. We've kind of thought about how we would build this, um, and we've kind of floated that with the contractors and the teams. They've kind of bought off on it, but I'm assuming that once we get into selection and into the next round of conversations, some of these teams may have different ideas on how to approach the construction of the project. Once we get our arms around an identified team and an approach, we'll be back out here talking about what those possible impacts could be or can't be. Um, but right at this point, going into a 30% design, it would be premature to sure. kind of speculate. I just want it to be on your mind, Tony. Oh, it is. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, Mr. Benson, you have a question? I just, I just have more of a comment. Um, you know, Mr. Schrudis and his expertise in putting together public-private partnerships is a big reason why we're going to have all of these uh, express lanes, uh, the Boulder Turnpike, uh, north on I-25, uh, C-470. Those are all HPTE projects, weren't they? Uh, yes. And there's no... Uh, there's no tax money to do that, so it's got to be a public-private exactly. partnership. The money's got to come from someplace unless it's going to be just a total toll road, and you know what the resistance to that would be. So exactly. really we owe a lot to Mike for putting these things together. And I would uh, certainly echo what the mayor has just said about Highway 270. If you've ever driven on it in the morning or the afternoon or just about any time during the daylight hours, uh, it's just it's, it's terrible. Leave a plan behind, because I know you're retiring. Leave a plan behind for that. I'm not retiring. I'm just changing jobs. <laughs> oh, well, well, okay. I'm, I'm sorry. There's a distinction there. You're right. Okay. Uh, leave a plan behind for 270 and also the Jefferson Parkway so that we can complete the loop. promise okay. you. Let that be your legacy. I promise you, Councilman. Thanks for the kind words. Okay. Thank you. All right. Mr. Amador? Uh, thank you, Michael. Um, just as a general question, you said that the project is in procurement right now. Can you speak a little bit to the timeline of the procurement sure. of the RFP? Sure. So, we, I mean, we spent all day before we came over here working on this RFP. It's a, it's a massive undertaking. The target is to get this RFP out in draft form on September 15, then work with the four shortlisted um, bidders, as Tony said, over the next seven or eight months, uh, refining that, listening to, you know, their alternative concepts, uh, coming to agreement on how to finally uh, put that out for bid, which will happen next year, probably the spring of next year. Um, and, uh, you know, we've got to wait for the record of decision, so I think that's, uh, that timing is a little bit flexible. But once we get it settled, then we will put it out for best value bid and, and uh, hopefully get that done by the end of the year, next year. Very good. Thank you. Okay. All right. Mr. Douglas. Yes. Uh, thank you, Michael. Um, you know, question about, um, I know Highway 36, a um, portion of that is, is, is a toll um, for those who like to be in that lane. And for I-70, is this set to go on for a long period of time because that contract's set for 50 years. Now, this contract here, when this is slated, is it something that's going to be continuous or is there going to sunset? One of the uh, uh, one of the lessons we learned in US 36 is that people don't like 50-year contracts. But uh, more seriously, this is a very different um, concept of public-private partnerships. US 36 needed toll revenues to get it paid for. Here we're going to use tolls 
to control the congestion on the lane and um, we don't need to leave an extra term out there to make sure yeah. everybody gets paid and so I think the anticipation is it will be about 30 years on this it's part of the bidding process but that's where I think we uh, need to be on this okay so total lanes right now there's eight lanes four lanes going each way correct I think so this right. would add 10 lanes total or 12 well, you're, you're getting into construction questions where okay. I get shaky. So, <laughs> so currently uh, it is a six-lane facility. Uh, phase one, the first part, will build an eight-lane facility, so there will be one managed lane in each uh, direction. Mm -hmm. So what's free today will remain free, and then an additional managed lane. Um, and then um, in certain sections we'll build it so that it can ultimately accommodate the 10-lane template. So in the uh, trenching section, uh, we will be uh, accommodating a 10-foot lane template. Okay. But that's future opening day will be eight lanes. All right. All right. Thank you. Great. Thank you both for coming in and, and the information for our community. Thank you. All right. Next, I'd like to call up Carmen Luna. Welcome, and, and when you get up to the podium, please state your name and address for the record. Hi. Hi, good Carmen evening. Carmen Luna, um, 6450 Monaco Street. Um, hello. I'm actually a new resident of Commerce City as of June. Um, and so I'm here today because I saw on Nine News the story of Sonia and her daughter in their backyard chickens. And as a resident of Commerce City, I've been wanting to get backyard chickens. I want to get them in the spring, and uh, her story inspired me to become involved in the civic process and civic engagement for making that happen. Um, so I know uh, Sonia couldn't be here tonight, but we've met and we've um, been talking about kind of the next steps to start getting an ordinance um, in writing and start the whole process with city council um, and the city of Commerce City. and. Um, and there's lots of other residents who are really interested in this topic as well. They're just not as comfortable coming forward in this setting and really aren't as educated or aren't educated yet about um, backyard chickens and, and why they would want them and what are the benefits and what are kind of the um, things that hinder people from wanting backyard chickens. So I guess really why I'm here is just to say that um, there are people that are interested in this topic and uh, I can be really annoying <laughs> and um, and ex I'm excited to be a Commerce City resident and start coming to these meetings and being involved in my community and going over some of the benefits and um, addressing some of the concerns with backyard chickens. I can talk forever about um, health related issues, food access related issues, community engagement issues. Um, I think there's uh, a lot of benefits, a lot of uh, a lot of areas of information to cover and um, yeah I just wanted to come this is my first meeting I've never been in this building and yeah well welcome this is what it's for that's right okay. I'm excited yeah. <laughs> well let me see if any of the council members have any comments um, thank you for coming in thanks um, let's see mr. Benson yeah, what is your position on this um, you mean personally yeah uh, well, personally, I have a public health background, and I'm very into health and uh, food access and active transportation, and my job has to deal with this. And so, um, you know, I have owned my first home on an acre in Commerce City, and I didn't, I wasn't as invested in my previous location at City Park. I was in a condo. So now that I'm married, I have a family, I, um, I want to be a good resident, I care about the community that I live in, and I feel like now that I have roots, I can do that here. And um, I know it sounds silly with it just being backyard chickens, but um, I think uh, having chickens and having, I want to have an urban garden, I think it's a good way to meet your neighbors. I think it's a good way to know where your food comes from. And I just think there's a lot of health benefits from it. And I think there needs to be a lot of education so around you, it. You would be for the city allowing backyard chickens? 100%. Okay. Now, you know, there were some people in here, what, two or three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And I think the council um, 
probably was not for that proposal, but uh, we suggested to them that they go out and gather, uh, what, 1,100 signatures mm -hmm. to get that issue on the ballot right. and let the people of the city vote on it. It, mm -hmm. might be, it might be too late at this point in time to get it on the ballot for this fall, but you could do it for next fall. That's what I would encourage you to do, because I don't think, I can only speak for myself, but I don't think the rest of this council is going to vote to change our ordinance with regard to barnyard animals, livestock being in people's backyards. But is it because you need people like us to come educate you about the issues? I mean, I right. have eight feral cats at my new home. I trapped them all myself. I went and got them fixed. I paid for it out of my own pocket. I got four kittens adopted. I mean, well, I think good. there's other issues. Dogs and cats are certainly uh, domesticated. Chickens, their feces animals. is a lot less than cats and dogs. You can use it for fertilizer, whereas the other, it's contaminated. There's pathogens in it. You have to right. throw it away. I mean, there's really a lot of benefits and things that are not nearly as detrimental to right. people's health and people living in the city. Do you know who Accurate the people chickens. were? Who are the people that are pushing this that were here a couple of weeks ago? Do you have? Do you have their? She just name? mentioned their name, Sonia. Sonia never she mentioned their name. Okay, as, so you know them. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I contacted her after I saw yeah, get, her story. Get with them and help them get it on the ballot. I'm going to. Okay. I thought the. I thought it was though. Once you did the ordinance, city council could either pass it, not pass it, or put it on the ballot. I thought there were three options. Well, if you come up with the signatures, I don't think the council has much of an option about. It putting it on the ballot. You come up with, the, with the, enough good signatures of registered voters, then the council will put it on the ballot. It's automatic. We don't have a choice. Well, the, if they it petition has, it has to be a the, vote. There has to be a vote taken on it, but you're right. right. It is, it's, it's, yeah. They have the right to put it on the ballot. Absolutely. Yeah, it'll, uh, you, you get the signatures. Remember, that it has to be registered voters mm -hmm. in, in the city of Commerce City that, that sign and make a good signature. But, All right. Uh, okay. All right, Mr. McEldowney. Hi, thanks for coming tonight. I think um, just to kind of clarify a couple of things, because I know that the, the piece on 9 News didn't kind of tell the whole story of the comments that we gave that night, obviously, and provide a very narrow uh, look at, at the, the takeaways. Um, a, we were not made aware the night that she was here that she had at present chickens. Uh, that was not disclosed until we saw the news piece. Um, I think the, the key to this whole subject is that we've had this come before us a couple times. And as the mayor spoke about that night, um, the city actually had the okay for backyard chickens and other livestock up to a certain point. Right. The challenge has been how well that was uh, facilitated by the folks that had the chickens and had the other livestock in the community. Um, I have friends all over the metro area and elsewhere in the country that uh, have and advocate for backyard chickens. I love the concept. Um, but I also have uh, living in a neighborhood with small footprint homes that rely on common space in terms of parks and open space as opposed to backyards. I don't have an acre. I live in a newer home on the other end of town. Um, and I see the difficulty that people have managing currently authorized animals in terms of dogs, cats, etc. And so the theory of chickens versus the practice of chickens is, is daunting. Mm -hmm. So just with that said, the, the council um, included in a community needs an assessment or community survey last year, earlier this year, a question about, do you support the idea of backyard chickens? And it was a dead heat, 50-50. So the council didn't feel confident saying, let's have staff pursue authoring an ordinance for us to approve if we've got this lukewarm reception based on that one survey, granted, one survey. So the comments that we gave Sonia last meeting were just that. There are three paths to pass this ordinance. And at this time, based on the information council has, we're not in a position to make this a priority and, and, and put forward an ordinance that's going to potentially see backlash. And this city, unfortunately, has a history of um, other animal regulating ordinances that have drawn quite the ire of portions of the community on both sides. Mm -hmm. And so there's a sensitivity to how this gets pursued. That said, Sonia was guided to work with the city clerk to understand clearly all of the steps related to the petition and the ordinance drafting process so that she had clear guidelines that didn't get tripped up if she chose to pursue that. I think it's fantastic that you guys have found each other, and I know for a fact there are other people out there. I've talked to them myself. Um, again, I think everybody in council is supportive of you guys taking the lead and going forward and doing 
peer-to-peer, neighbor-to-neighbor education on the subject. Mm -hmm. We have asked, and we asked at at that last meeting, for staff to bring some follow-up on their past update to us in the form of a study session specifically to look at neighboring communities who have authorized backyard chickens over the last X years and identify, to the extent they can quantify, what have been the negative impacts. Because the challenge is obviously enforcement. We know people have backyard chickens in this community today even though it's not authorized. And by and large, we don't hear about it because they're under the radar or their neighbors aren't bothered. Because it's not a problem. Because, well, in those instances. But where it is a problem, when we don't have a law to govern that, and we certainly don't have staff that's in a position to go out and manage that, we have to strike a balance of how many staff does it take to manage if we start to get complaints. So if I have a four-foot fence in my yard, as an example, and I have a dog on one side of the fence that's not mine, and I have a chicken on my side of the fence, and there's a conflict, they're both authorized to be here, we create a quality of life issue. So these are just, again, some of the things that I think in thinking about beyond what the, the ideal pros are of, of backyard chickens, mm-hmm. looking at the reality of how does that chicken fit in each corner of our community mm-hmm. and what are the ways to balance it. And it's not a question to answer tonight. It's, a, it's something for you guys to think about as you look at what your educational uh, initiative is in the community and, and where we can help um, direct staff to do pieces of analysis that will help us from a fact-based discovery perspective, we would love, I think, to do that. And that's part of the reason that we've asked staff to come back at that next study set or at that future study session. So again, I guess my question would be, has Sonia had her initial dialogue with the city clerk and gotten those uh, those basic uh, framework guidelines? Mm -hmm. And if so, then then fantastic. And Mm -hmm. I am eager to see how this unfolds. Yep. Does that make sense? We are working on it. And okay. um, yeah, I mean, I know everything that she's doing. Okay. I'm just, I'm just here. Okay. <laughs> well, it's Susan. good to meet you. And I'm glad you came. It's yeah. Good engagement to meet you is too. huge. And I, I would argue a lot of your points, but I won't right now. So. All right. Councilwoman Carson. Uh, <clears throat> Carmen, thanks for coming. Thanks. Uh, Mr. McEldowney hit on a lot of the points that Mm -hmm. that I was going to say is that this council, it was my understanding that we did direct staff to do a study session um, and also bring us information from surrounding cities who have backyard chickens and and bring us up to date what the pros and the cons are on that. Um, And then that survey that we did. And I would say that I, I, I am open to the idea um, but I will tell you what Mr. McEldowney said is, is it is a frightening thing to make this change because when he speaks of quality of life, it, it's in all different directions. Quality of life could be you who, who wants to say, I, I'm going to feed my fam, family healthy eggs. I know what's going on here. Quality of life could be the neighbor who says <clears throat> living next door to these chickens is horrendous. Um, There's also a a question came up of the quality of life of the chicken. Are we talking about chickens in two-foot cages and they never come out? I don't know. So Mm -hmm. I definitely need an education on this, which I'm hoping through the study session that we will get. Um, I do believe you're going about it the proper way uh, in in bringing this information to light. Um, Maybe at the next survey, if, if you and Sonia had been out here and working the public and educating people, that survey may have really gone to the other side of 60% supporting it. Um, I will tell you, every one of us knows that we get a lot of phone calls relating to animals. We allow dogs in the city. And chickens may not be as noisy or as aggressive as a dog, but it is an issue. Um, And a lot of our houses on our very small lots. Mm-hmm. And so, I, honestly, I don't know what that means. But, but I would say go out and continue building the public support. I do believe it's a direction that we see most people in communities going to. Um, like I said, I'm not against you. Uh, mm-hmm. I just don't think I'm brave enough right now to, without further education, to say mm-hmm. that I would feel free to, to move in that direction. My only argument right there is that chickens don't need a lot of space. All the ordinances have you put in how much space that they need, minimum. Um, and, you know, Stapleton right down the street, I don't like, I don't like to compare 
community to community because I think every community is unique in their own way. But when they build a new house, one of the check boxes you can say is in your new house, do you want a chicken coop? And I know you've seen how tiny those yards are. So I would argue that you don't need a lot of space for chickens. And we can provide more information on that. But That's part of that educational piece right. that I think is very important. Yes. But, but honestly, thank you for coming. Mm -hmm. um, I wish all citizens would be active and pursue their interests the way that you and Sonia are doing. So thank you. Well, I'll be here for a long time. So. <laughs> all right, Carmen, I just want to say thank you for coming in. Thanks. Good luck on this endeavor. I think that when there's a 50-50 balance of what the residents want, I think it should go on the ballot. So I, I, I hope that you get your petition done, and we'll see how things work out. Thank you. All right, thank have you. a good day. All right, now it looks like we're going to deal with soccer. And I see a whole bunch of soccer kids in the audience. So thanks for being here. Let's, uh, let's see what Rihanna has to say. Rihanna? You're going to bring them all up at one time? Because I've got several on here. So all the Campo, Campo soccer folks that, that are going to speak, come on up. Um, unless you want to take separate times. But you're more than welcome to come up. I'm sure you're here for the same issue. And I know Guillermo will probably wait so he can get his three minutes, which is fine. But come on up and address the council. I need you to state your name and address for the record. Buenas noches. Buenas, Buenas tardes, noches. perdón. Mi nombre es Reina Soria. Good afternoon. My name is... Reina Soria. Reina Soria. Mi dirección es 7191 Pontiac Street. My address is... 7191. 7... 7191 7101 91 91 Pontiac Street Pontiac Street Commerce City Colorado Código Postal 80022 Commerce City Colorado Zip Code 822 Y pues venimos aquí para darle las gracias y primero contarles un poquito de la historia de estos niños que no tenían donde practicar hace exactamente entre 5 y 6 años and so today I wanted to come up to you and tell you about a story about kids who uh, wanted to play soccer between the ages of and the seis a from 6 to 14 years age. Este, entonces nosotros nos estábamos desanimando un poco porque pues nosotros nos estábamos desanimando un poco porque no teníamos espacio en donde tenerlos, lo único que queríamos era que ellos no tenerlos Todo el tiempo en videojuegos, en Nintendo, en que anduvieran por las calles sin hacer nada. Nosotros éramos lo que era lo que y es lo que queríamos y es lo que queremos tener unos buenos ciudadanos. So we were a little bit uh, concerned for our children of uh, where uh, they could practice for soccer, and we didn't want them to be at home playing video games. And so um, what we wanted to do is be good citizens. Y pues por esa razón venimos a darles las gracias, ya que pues fue algo muy bonito para nosotros recibir el apoyo de ustedes, especialmente de Guillermo y Tim Moore, que nos ayudó mucho con todo el papeleo. And so we wanted to come here and give you thanks for giving us a space to practice. Uh, we want to thank uh, Guillermo and Tim Moore, who uh, supported us. También al señor Rodríguez, él nos ayudó en la interpretación cuando íbamos a las juntas ahí al centro de recreación. Then we also want to thank Mr. Rodríguez who uh, helped us with translation needs over at the rec center. Y pues este, también quiero hacerles saber que este, los niños que están aquí no son todos los que, los que son. Nos faltan muchos más, solamente vinieron unos pocos. Pero en nombre de ellos, ya que son nuestro futuro, pues muchísimas gracias a todos y a cada uno de ustedes. And so the kids that come today are not all of the kids that practice soccer. It's just uh, a few of them. But um, on behalf of them, we want to thank you because they are our future. Gracias. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'd like to say... Go ahead. First of all, I'd like to say you're welcome. But secondly, it comes with a price. Because we, as, as the city, expect with the kind of facility you have now, that some of these kids become professionals and do our city proud. All right? 
That's important. We got to get back too. Okay. Um, we'll start off with Councilwoman Carson. Thank you for coming, and and I want to speak to the youth. Thank you. Um, thank you for wanting to play soccer and be active. And as the mayor said, we are looking at some of you as future soccer players here at the Rapids. Uh, but thank you for taking the time out and, and coming to council. That That's very nice. Um, and thanks to the parents and everyone who had a hand in making sure that these kids who want to play soccer have a safe place to practice. But thanks to everyone. Mr. Bullock. I'd like to say uh, thank you and you're welcome also from the council. Um, it is a rare time when you see the room fill up like this and it's people coming in to say thank you. Uh, we were all wondering when we saw everybody come in what was going on, but this is the kind of crowd that brings smiles to our face because you are coming back and saying thank you for something that we did that had a really positive aspect throughout the community. So what I want to say is thank you to you and to all the youth out here that are actually active and wanting to play soccer and look for, looked for and found a way to get a field and play your game. So from City Council here, thank you. Mr. Amador. Thank you for coming tonight, Raina, and representing uh, your community and your soccer uh, youth. It's encouraging to see that you're not allowing a language barrier to stand in your way for the youth. And I'm extremely uh, hopeful that all the kids have a healthy and productive lifestyle outside of video games and uh, television. So thank you for coming. It's appreciated. And I have one more person that I need to thank, especially when it comes to your opportunity for your practice field. If it wasn't for Guillermo Serna coming to this council and asking us to pursue the opportunity to utilize some of the fields, um, we would not have known and not been able to engage our staff to make that happen. So thank you to Mr. Serna for, for his efforts on, on helping you find a place to practice soccer. All right, now, before I, before I stop, I want to make sure I get everybody. Elzar? Is it okay? Do you, want, do you have something you want to say? Uh, buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Estos, me llamo Eliazar Sierra. My name is Eliazar Sierra. Vivo en Commerce City. I live in Commerce City. Yo soy el que me hago cargo de todos los niños. I'm the one in charge of all the kids. A, en, con ayuda de los papás. With the help of the parents. En, estoy muy agradecido con ustedes por andarnos batallando mucho. Ahora no. And I'm very thankful that you guys supported us uh, because now... Um, we were struggling, but now we're not. Muchas Good. Gracias. Thank you so much. You're more than welcome, you. and thank you. Keep the kids active. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Mr. Cerna. Can you hear me? Guillermo yeah. Cerna, 14122 is the 102nd place. Commerce City, Colorado, 80022. Give him your address. Okay. She's a little bit shy. Hmm? Her name is Elizabeth. She can always come up here where we can hear her better. <laughs> or she want to go. <laughs> All right. This is something very special, simply because of the process that we went through. And I think you know, Mayor, as well as everybody else, almost 20 some years. But when that one gentleman from Cronky came and he went to the back and he after he had spoken for whatever was happening at the time, and he went back and he says, we're going to take care of this. I want to thank him 
for following through and working with the recreation center administration and the process sometimes that has to happen after they understood what was happening. This young lady here, we say we want something back. There's a couple of other gentlemen back there that play on the soccer team. And what I want you to understand is they've won one championship and they've been second or third in others. And they've done it in a process. One of them right now is possibility maybe being hopefully in the next coming years and that's Mrs. Reina's son as a goalie because he's good. That kid is good. And uh, it, it's important that, that all the kids that are there, which is about a hundred and some, okay, with opportunity of the male playing soccer, but also the females having that possibility. And they're playing with them. I've shown the recreation manager some of the film that, that, of the kids that are out there. And I witnessed the, uh, the, the pride, okay, when this one parent was on the phone and she was talking. And they were asking her where she was. She says, well, I'm over here at the Rapids practicing. The encouragement that is occurring, not just here, but Brighton also, in what could happen. And that's maybe having a, like a soccer tournament or something between Brighton and the two high schools. Because some of them are that good. So all I want to say is, is thank you for, for listening and thank you for putting up with me and thank you for the results. Because the smile on this child, that's the biggest thank that, that we can all, okay? So I can't name everybody because it's been a long process, but thanks again. You know, I so, want to say, Guillermo, first of all, congratulations. I, I think it's awesome that these kids can play soccer on a field right next door to the only major league stadium in the state of Colorado outside of the city limits of Denver mm -hmm. and be able to see that the opportunities there for them to play inside that stadium someday. And that's why I said it would be great if you all try hard enough, we're going to have some professionals come out of Commerce City and they're going to show this community proud by, by achieving that goal. And a lot of it's due to your efforts in helping them to achieve this, this location for, for practice. So, so thank you and congratulations to all of the soccer players and all of the Campos uh, folks. Um, I'm glad you now have a home. And the coaches are certified and sanctioned through the Commerce City Recreation Center. That's that was the, the most important part. Once it gets sanctioned and certified, that's where it starts growing, and I think yep. we'll have more kids participating. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, all of all of the soccer players. Thanks for coming in tonight. Um, I'll take just a short break. So those of you who are here for the soccer piece and want to go home and have dinner, you're more than welcome to leave. And then as soon as as soon as the room is cleared out, then I'll go ahead and continue with the meeting. And unless you all want to stay, you're more than welcome to stay. <clears throat> We, they do do that. Commerce City does it, but it's done through our school system. The school system gives it to the parents and children. Mm -hmm. so, okay. Okay, before I move on in our agenda, I want to double check 
to make sure that there's not anybody left in the audience that didn't get a chance to sign up that would like to speak to the council. If, if you're here to speak at citizen communication, now's the time to raise your hand so I can make sure that you get heard. All right, seeing no further citizen communication, we'll move on in the agenda. <clears throat> Next item on the agenda is approval of the minutes. We'll start with May 18th, 2015. First, I need a motion from the council to allow me to abstain from voting on the minutes because of an excused absence. Uh, is there a motion for my abstention? We'll go with Mr. Bullock. So move. Mr. McEldowney. Second. Motion and a second for my abstention is here. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion is carried. Now I'm asking for a motion to approve the minutes of May 18th. All right, Mr. Douglas. Motion to approve minutes from May 18, 2015. Thank you. Mr. Amador. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the minutes of May 18, 2015. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. That motion is carried. Now we'll deal with the June 1st minutes. I'm open for a motion to approve the minutes of June 1st. Uh, Mr. Teeter. Motion to approve the minutes for June 1st. 2015. Mr. Bullock. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the minutes for June 1st, 2015. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. That motion is carried. And then we'll move on to the consent agenda. The consent agenda includes items that are routine, procedural, informational, self-explanatory, and non-controversial. They are presented to council for a single motion and vote. Any member of the council may ask to remove a specific item for further discussion and a separate vote. Tonight there are five items listed under the consent agenda. Does anyone on the council wish to remove an item off of the consent agenda for further discussion and a separate vote? Seeing no one, I need a motion to approve the consent agenda. Mr. Bullock. Move to approve the consent agenda. Mr. McEldowney. Second. Thank you. I have a motion and a second. Will the city attorney read the titles of the consent agenda items? Title of Ordinance 2061, an ordinance amending section 21-7730, parens 4, of the Commerce City Land Development Code relating to electric fences. Title of Ordinance 2066, an ordinance authorizing a First Amendment to a previously executed master lease purchase agreement and providing other matters relating thereto. Title of Resolution 2015-70, Resolution Approving Intergovernmental Agreement Regarding a Joint Water Commission. Title of Resolution 2015-80, Resolution Submitting to the Electors of the City of Commerce City at the regular election to be held November 3, 2015, two ballot questions the first, whether to change the city charter regarding locations for posting of ordinances, and the second, to place a 5% excise tax on certain marijuana transfers and setting the ballot language, therefore. Title of Resolution 2015-83, Resolution Approving the Purchase of 12 Police Department Utility Vehicles. Thank you. I have a motion to second. Titles have been read. I'm going to ask for a roll call vote. It's not working. Councilman McCarson's uh, buttons for the vote are not working. You, uh, since since she's not on there, do you want to call the roll or reset it? Whatever's easier for you, Cheryl. Press the I guess it is. Okay. There you go. All right, push it now. All right, now it's working. All right, if everybody will please vote again. All right. For the record, is it, is it coming up or no? It's up there? All right. For the record, 
Uh, consent agenda has been approved unanimously. Um, we'll move on to resolutions. We'll start with resolution 2015-82. What are the desires of council? Mr. Bullock. Move to approve resolution 2015-82. Mr. McEldowney. Second. I have a motion and a second. Um, before we continue, I want to ask, is there anyone in the audience who would like to come forward and address the council on this item? Seeing no one. Is there anyone on council that has any discussion on this item? Seeing no one. I'm going to ask the city attorney to read the title. Title reads, Resolution 2015-83, Resolution Approving the per Excuse me. Title of Resolution 2015-82, Resolution Authorizing an Award of Contract with New World Systems Corporation. Thanks. Thank you. I have a motion to second. Title has been read. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Motion is carried. We'll move on to ordinances. We have Ordinance 2067. Does Council have any questions regarding this ordinance? Seeing none, is there anyone in the audience who uh, would like to address the Council on this ordinance? Seeing no one, I'm open for a motion. Mr. Bullock. Move to introduce Ordinance 2067. Council is seated. Thank you. Mr. Amador. Second. A motion is second to introduce Ordinance 2067. City Attorney, please read the title. Title reads, An Ordinance Repealing Paragraphs B and C of Section 8-2317 of the Commerce City Revised Municipal Code, which contains certain separation requirements for the co-location of marijuana businesses. Thank you. I have a motion to second. Title's been read. I'll ask for a roll call vote. Yours isn't working again? Okay. We do. Uh, okay. Let it reset completely before you push your button. All right, go ahead now and, and re vote. All right. For the record, uh, ordinance. 2067, um, the amendment has been approved on first reading unanimously. Next item, we go into presentations. We're going to start out with a presentation on Highway 2 widening project, lighting and landscape review. I'd like to ask Ms. DeAndre, who's already up here, um, to go ahead and make her presentation. Right. Thank you, Mayor and City Council. Thank you. As you may recall, a couple of months ago, we had a very robust discussion about um, the lighting and landscaping and aesthetics along Tower Road. And so this, the purpose of the discussion tonight is just to circle back with some of the direction that was received from Council and to kind of close some of those loops and just tell you where we are in the project for the benefit of the public. So with that, again, the goals of this project are to not only increase the vehicle capacity, so how many uh, vehicles we can um, accommodate out there, but also improve the safety and eliminate the flooding that's occurring out there, as well as being environmentally and contextually sensitive. And what that means is really designing the roadway to fit into its environment, not only for where it is now, but for what's anticipated in the future. And then, of course, being multimodal, which means accommodating all types of users, so not just vehicles, but also bicyclists and pedestrians as well. So this drawing just shows the cross-section of what we'll be building out there. So we will be constructing the median first with the two lanes on the inside and then the, uh, the bike lanes on either side. And as you can see where the street lights and the signal poles are located in their ultimate location, which will allow for that third lane to be built on either side at some point in the future when the traffic volumes warrant. We also will be adding a six-foot sidewalk on the east side 
for pedestrians. And then on the west side, if you're not comfortable riding on the street, there's a 10-foot multi-use path, which allows for both pedestrians and bicyclists. So one of the uh, items that we did talk about was the street lighting analysis, and the consensus from council at that study session was to go with the light emitting diode, or LED as it's known, and to have the city own and maintain that. However, we were also asked, staff was asked to analyze solar-powered lighting as an additional option. <coughs> solar power is available for LED lighting, and so we did do some investigation into that, and here's just a rendering of what that might look like. Um, the application typically is that there's a solar panel attached or fixed to the top of each um, pole, and so in typical uses, it's, uh, the condition is where there's not regular uh, electrical facilities available to power those lighting systems. Um, however, they also are available to feed back into the electrical system, similar to if you had a, a network of solar panels on your house, and Council Member Douglas has suggested that we look into that as well. Um, but as far the feedback that we're getting from our consultant was that the lumen output, or which is the amount of light, which is a measure of the amount of light, doesn't meet AASHTO requirements. And so that the light distribution was not going to be enough to cover those, um, all the lanes, as well as we had uh, concerns about covering the sidewalk or the multi-use path as well. Um, also, they're very expensive compared to the LED option where it's just uh, electricized via an underground um, wire, but there's often grants available to offset those initial costs. So in looking at those options, we did feel still that um, the look of the solar power panel on top wasn't really what we were going for, and still, so staff would still recommend that we proceed with the LED um, lighting that's electricized just from a regular um, current. However, as I mentioned, Councilmember Douglas would like to see us look at a solar power that is, feeds off the electrical system or feeds back into it where we could actually get credits. Um, the light coverage, what this shows right here, this outer green band is that lumen output at which is required. Um, it's actually per AASHTO requirements. It just shows the level of light. If this is a signal pole here, the black dots, how much lighter that gets as you go out. So the red band is where the edge of the pavement is, and this is the sidewalk on either side. So you can see that this does cover the sidewalk or the multi-use path by using the lights just as they are. So the, the bands there just show that, that output. So if you recall, we had talked about having the lights off the back of the pole, um, like this example shows. That is not necessary based on the uh, lights that we're predicting or showing here, is that that one light is enough to cast that, that um, large of a circle, and you can see that there is overlap there um, at the middle. This again is just an example comparing on the right is our existing poles that we have along 104th and Highway 2. And this is similar to the look that we would have on uh, Tower Road, except the base here and the pole would be very similar to this style on the right with this type of head or something very similar to it. Again, that's just an example showing also the banner poles that we were, were going to put in, but not have we do not need to put in that backlight for the sidewalk or the multi-use path. Those existing lights are adequate to cover that. Um, so with that, for the LED lights, um, we would go with the direction would be a dark color with similar bases and poles to those existing lights on 104th. There would be no mast arms, so they would just be right off the, um, essentially off the pole. And then we would provide for banners on each of them. And so that in the future, there's a lot of flexibility about how we install those banners, but likely we would focus those banners initially just at the intersections. So I'll stop for questions there before I move into landscaping.
Does anybody have any questions? If you do, raise your hand. I'm not Mr. Amador. On the uh, lumen chart that you have there mm -hmm. where the green is at, mm -hmm. which light fixture is that lumen chart generated from? That was the uh, LED guard co product that we were um, recommending, and this is this one on the left. The one on the left, and then mm -hmm. if we go back to uh, slide four, is the go back one more, oh. one more, right there. That would be the light on the left side of the drawing here. Correct. Yeah, except it would not have the the mast arm. This rendering wasn't updated for the for the slideshow. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions? Okay, Mr. Benson. Go back to that first slide and show the, the difference. The next. Oh. So you're talking about the one on the left? Correct. Mm -hmm. Not the one on the right, which is what we got on 104. The, 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 this base here, that what they call a guard, would be the same. Here you just see a pole attached to a concrete base. So we would have a very dark metallic pole with this base, with this head. It's if, just the base. If that makes sense, yeah. That base with that head. This looks a little bit kind of plain. So this, this dresses it up and gives it a more okay, finished good. look. That's all I have. Thank you. Okay. Mr. McDowney. Thanks for the update. Uh, with regard to the solar, I think um, I, I think we all agree that we need to take every step we can in terms of being sustainable. And I think the the entire approach that we've taken in terms of shifting to this look at um, in pursuit of owned poles and an LED is a, is a is a huge step forward relative to where we've been. I think beyond that, this really gets back to the, the citywide sustainability plan, planning that we've talked about budgeting for and looking at what the role is of solar production in that mix as a city responsibility. Um, I think that the challenge is, I mean, ideally, I'd love to see a solar you know, collector on the top of every pole, the, the ability to gather the amount of energy needed in that small of a footprint and for the cost is just not there yet and that's uh, that's obviously part of the challenge so um, I think this is a great a great fit I think it will help obviously we've seen the cost benefit analysis from from staff's work um, but I would definitely say that let's uh, let's ensure that as we pursue that sustainability dialogue we make sure that solar energy at, or, or other energy production is included in that and obviously we've we've taken steps to that end with this building when we went through our performance contracting initiative and, and did our assessment of, of opportunities on uh, renewable energy and we leveraged renewable energy credits and performance contracting to do that here. We did not at the time have sufficient capacity in that business case to look at taking similar steps on the rec center or the MSC or otherwise, but I think, you know, uh, I don't think about it. The, the intent at the time was to look at how do we pr continue in that effort and take an ongoing look at our entire built environment in terms of, uh, you know, HVAC and, and, mm -hmm. and built systems in general to see where we can continue to take those steps and leverage the opportunity to, to generate credits and, and use those from a performance contract perspective to cover the cost of those investments and make sure that they make sense. So um, thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Douglas? Uh, thank you, Andrea. Uh, Maria, sorry about that. Um, yes, I did ask about, um, about being grid smart. Um, solar has come a long ways, and affordability is, is a lot less than it was um, when we put the solar panels on the roof. So um, I'm looking at having that tied to the grid instead of having batteries being charged up. Uh, this right here we can either claim carbon credits or solar credits, and this is just a way of the future. And I think being ahead of the curb instead of behind this is always going to generate, generate electricity. This is a cost savings to the citizens between now and, and, and forever. So um, I, I do appreciate you pursuing that to see what the cost uh, effect would be. Anyone else? 
Okay, you can go on. Okay. I'll transition into the landscaping review. So if you recall, our, uh, in keeping with our project goals, we really wanted to achieve or go for a more xeric um, type of materials, which means basically that they use less water. That doesn't mean that they're not going to be irrigated, but we did want to be very water conscious and conserve water to the extent possible while also adding some color and uh, height and just kind of interest to the corridor. So what we focused on is pockets of landscaping, so not the entire median, but using a lot of natural materials, stone, uh, boulders, but also then doing those pockets where we would have um, trees in there as well as some landscaping and um, in order to vary, again, that height and the types of material. Uh, so at our uh, previous discussion, there was direction to incorporate some trees, so I'm bringing those drawings back to you to take a look at those. We were very conscious of what the sight lines are for any type, not only for the intersections that we have today, but the intersections that could be there in the future. It's to be conscious of where those sight lines are so that we're not putting in trees that are just going to be, have to be taken out or cause some sort of obstruction in the future. So this uh, rendering shows the, the median there. This would be current after installation. And you can see the pocket or the, um, we call a little button with the Commerce City design. This is very typical along 104th as well as Quebec, is to have that kind of raised median with that sandstone finish here and on the concrete pavement. And then that nose would be finished out with some landscaping materials. And then you can see here it transitions to just rocks with boulders and then trees in the straightaway section. This shows at a mature or grown up condition. These would be smaller, more um, decorative trees, so they're not the ones that are going to get three feet in diameter at the trunk. Um, so they would be designed for that median condition. We've also talked with the uh, landscape designer about what types of materials really make sense, not just the xeric uh, type that's low water, but also what's been used already within Commerce City that's been working well. So some of these uh, Stella Dioro daylilies have been very successful. You see those on uh, chambers just south of 120th, as well as some of the more um, different types of uh, grasses and low bushes. So we w do want to kind of keep some of the materials that have already been, been working in the mix. This just shows the lighting at night with that uh, mature landscape. And this is again is just a plan view again with the idea is that we would have a node of landscaping separated by sections of just um, decorative median that's concrete. We are going to put a diamond etch. Uh, you have to score the concrete so that it, uh, it has regular places where it can break. So instead of just doing a straight um, vertical cut, we're going to do a diamond pattern just to give it a little bit of something. So with that, we're also, uh, we've incorporated those trees, not only into the median, but we've also done, um, this was an idea that came up at our study session, was to create a rest stop. One on each side, um, we've created with a couple of benches. So we're doing one near a pond on the west side of the road and then one near Second Creek uh, where we'll actually also be incorporating some peach trees. So HEAL stands for Healthy Eating and Active Living, which the City Council passed a resolution back in 2013 to support the HEAL initiative. And that's basically working with community enterprise to look at ways where Again, we can uh, foster and encourage healthy eating and active living. And one of the ideas that we had that came out of HEAL was to actually install fruit trees at this rest stop. So we're actually going to do a series of peach trees where if you stop there, if it's in season, you can uh, get a peach and just take a break. Um, working with Erin Mooney, she also will work with a school to go and harvest those peaches when it comes time. So they won't just be left there to rot and fall, but that they will actively be um, harvested to go back and feed the community. So we thought that was a really great way to work that into this project. 
Um, again, talked about the xeric materials. And then uh, no spray irrigation will be used. Instead, it will be all drip irrigation placed in the median. And um, Castle Rock has a very aggressive water um, system that's called their water-wise standards. And so we're meeting those standards with this uh, spray irrigation. And I mentioned the diamond pattern. So with that, just a couple of other things that had come up. Um, delineation of the bike lanes was one comment from council where we would actually create a physical barrier between the outer through lane and the bicycle lane. We did evaluate that, but it um, very much complicates snow removal operations because basically we have the big plow coming and plowing. Now that curb is there that it would need to push the snow into. Now we have to come back with a second smaller piece of equipment to clear that lane out. And um, we don't think that the additional effort related to that is really warranted since we do have that wider um, buffer area between the bike lane and the, that outer through lane. Then in pavement delineators, because the road is so straight, we don't feel that those are necessary at this time. Uh, and because we have the raised median, that it'll separate the northbound from the southbound traffic. Um, however, we will be considering using those on Highway 2 in the painted median areas. And then finally, tabs or markers for the utilities. This picture just shows um, something that's been used in other areas where you can mark the location either of water valves, uh, fire hydrants, anything like that by placing those in that uh, grass strip just behind the curb. So we will definitely incorporate something like that into the design. So I'll stand for any questions on landscaping and then just uh, wrap up with some of the next steps for the project. All right. Um, there, are, there are a few, and I could tell you, first off, that the peach trees, they would never go to waste. Someone will see those, and they will pull it in, and they will harvest bushels at a time. So um, I think you're, you're safe there, but uh, it's going to be who gets there first. Um, we're going to start with Mr. Mr. McEldowney. Thanks so much, Maria. Um, two questions, um, and I'm glad you brought up the comment about the curb cuts because I uh, had been watching the work going on uh, for the future curb cut for the uh, the new Lutheran High School there on 104th, and it was sad to see one of the trees that had actually been thriving uh, no longer there, um, especially in an area where we've had so much difficulty with the trees that have been put in either by the city or builders. Um, so I'm glad to see that there'll be some thinking ahead of time on where future curb cuts are likely to occur and, and, and build, build with that in mind. Um, with that said, um, it, it dawned on me that we didn't talk in our last conversation and we don't have highlighted here what's happening on either edge of the road. Uh, if we think about 104th, for example, or our other roadways, we do have uh, a tree element uh, that's been woven into that tree lawn. Um, it's a requirement from our residential builder, uh, you know, standards. Um, and it, obviously there's a balance in how much of that you put in overall care and, and cost of upkeep and tree replacement over time. Um, are we not looking at doing anything other than a lawn, tree lawn at this point, and, and looking then to have property owners have, a, have the requirement for putting in the trees? I'm just a little concerned that it would look as bleak as the, the, the representation does in the slides if we don't have some component of trees. Yes, uh, Council Member Donna, you're, you're correct. Right now our plan is this area between the curb and the walk or the multi-use path would just be naturally seeded. Okay. And that as somebody, as the developers came in, they would landscape out to the curb and okay. in, introduce trees. Because they need to be irrigated, um, we did not feel that we were going to go, and, and who knows what the developer wants to do in that area. We chose not to incorporate trees out there. And that makes sense. That, that answers the question that we won't be irrigating that strand. So we'll be seeding it similar to what we've done in Quebec. Correct. As an yeah. interim approach. Okay. Thank you. All right. Mr. Benson. Yes. Thank you, Maria. Um, you know, I was the one that raised the issue about putting a physical barrier between the bike lane and the regular lanes. Um, I just don't like the idea of having the bike lanes right there in the roadway. Um, that's the sort of thing that you do when you're taking an existing roadway and adding a bike lane to it. Here we got the chance to start from scratch. Uh, I don't know if it's a matter of speed. 
I don't want to create a, a bike race course along the 104th, I mean, along the Tower Road. Somebody wants to race, there's plenty of opportunities for that, but um, I just don't like it being that close to the cars. Hell, I see people riding up and down Highway 2 with a shoulder that's about this big on a bicycle, and I wonder how stupid can people be to do that. I mean, I, I've ridden a bike all over the state, and uh, I sure am not going to do something that's that stupid. But I, I just, I just, I don't like that. But I'm sure that's the way it's going to be built. Um, and uh, the delineation of the lanes, you should be able to see the median, so you know where the you're not going to cross over that. But is it possible to put? Um, is there going to be a curb there? Yes, there you know, will there, be. There are reflectors that you can put in the curb. You know, where you can see that. Now, not down um, on the pavement like you're going to do on Highway 2, but you can put reflectors in the curb there, which will help people determine, especially when it's raining or there's snow on the ground, um, that will help them determine where the median is. You know, of course, I'm a person, I can't see anything, you know. But I think as people get older, that's the way that everybody gets. And um, I just like to see some reflectors put in that, uh, in the curb, on the median, not down, in the pavement, because I agree with you, uh, it's so straight. Maybe you don't need that, but of course Highway Two is pretty straight too, and I think we really need it there, especially when it rains or there's snow on the ground. But that's that's all. Anyway, thank you for your presentation. Thank you for all the work that you've done, designing this, because I'm sure. Uh, it's not that easy, you know, to design a, a road like this and, and uh, get it going, get it built. So thanks a lot. Councilman McCarson. Um, thank you also. Can you explain a little more of this rest stop to me? What size will this be? Is this a place cars can pull off? Is it just bicycles? Is it benches that they rest on? I mean, I don't understand. I'm sorry. Uh, rest stop may have been a, a poor term. Yeah, it's not a pull-off by any means. It would be just if you're on your bike or taking a walk, that it would be, a, it's a couple of benches and probably um, eight peach trees and then a variety of lower bushes. So probably an area of, you know, 10 by 20 at, at the most. And, and on it, just one side of the roadway? Right. Uh, just on one side with, with the trees. On the west side, we're, we're going to um, do a couple of benches, but then just more... Uh, evergreen types of trees so that we provide year-round color, so not the peach trees. Um, is there any way to provide some shade there if, if they were stopping to set on the bench? Because I don't know how much shade you get out of an evergreen tree. I guess you... Yeah, we can certainly look at doing a more of uh, the deciduous type of trees versus the evergreens to provide that shade, certainly. And then... Um... What kind of a cost are we looking at if we do variations in height in that medium, in the concrete work for the planting? If you vary the heights in, in what that actual medium height is. Uh, <clears throat> as I've been driving around, I look at everybody's mediums now. I think that's a, a, a very appealing look, and it really adds some architectural design. Um, I don't know. I, I know any time that you pouring more, it, the cost is more, but um, this has been the desire of this council to make this a roadway that honestly is, is very attractive because it's going to be the way most people come into our city. Yeah, so the, this is a, um, this look here with that Commerce City button and that kind of sloped angle here on the median is typical of what you see along Quebec um, as well as 104th and then Chambers. So we're not only looking for that height variation on the concrete portion, but then also within the landscaping materials that are actually planted there. So we want some tall things, we want some lower things, we want some color even in the winter. Um, so having more of those, um, not evergreen trees, but more evergreen bushes so that there's a little bit of color out there year round. So that was what I meant by the, the varying uh, types of materials and heights. I, I did understand that. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, and, and not to be critical, but I find ours a little boring compared to what I see in other cities around. And, um, and, and I, I'm not so sure that we have to keep everything 
continually consistent as far as that goes. Um, this is what ours look like. But, but I have seen, like I said, I, I think when you vary the height of the actual build out of those planters and those planters are changing heights, I, I just find that to be a very nice look. Uh, it, it gives you another element instead of just working with plants to change height. And then sometimes I think it actually even keeps some of that spray back that comes off the roads out of the planters and the plants don't deal with as much as that salt or chemical that you're putting on the roads when you put the planters higher. Yes, that's, uh, you, it's hard to see quite in here, but if you look closely, we are doing this one foot of band on either side with some of those smaller rocks. And then the, on the inside, it will be more of a um, crushed granite material. So we do have that one foot border to prevent some of that um, material from spraying up and getting at some of those tree roots. Okay, thank you. Mr. Amador. Thank you, Maria, for your uh, presentation. Um, on this non-irrigated native seed, I would just um, caution that from the timing of year that you do uh, put that seed down to, in the city's best interest to pay attention to the specifications on the warranty and the maintenance. Um, typically, your uh, warranty would be and the maintenance would be from 30 days from when it establishes. Um, so say for instance this happens in September and the native seed never really establishes or it started to establish, I think you really want to pay attention to when the seed germinates. So you really want to let that come up, germinate one time so that the seeds actually spread out and it really takes. Um, so from a specification standpoint, I think um, making sure that our specifications are solid to when you would be planting the native seed, making sure that it does germinate one time to get the best value to the, the city. Um, it's always kind of a, a, a minor issue, but it, it can end up costing a lot of dollars when you uh, don't specify it right. So I would just caution that we're there. And then it does say non-irrigated native seed, correct? So it's just put it down and it kind of establishes I believe that it does have to be watered by hand or by truck for okay. those first 30 days. So I've, um, I'll verify with the specification but that it's got to germinate at least and take before um, it, it, so it doesn't get no water. But then after, once it takes, then Mother Nature would take over and it would not be irrigated other than from whatever rain fell at that point. Yes, and I do know also that... Um, from the time that that does go, I would maybe think about in the specification as well to uh, let that native seed establish for one year, you know, before you cut it uh, too much because if you cut it too early, it never establishes and then you're back in the same position of wasting money. So I would just caution that we do that. Um, and I'm happy to see these raised medians um, the way that they are in their landscape. So. Um, I'm sure there's probably a conversation out there to be had, but uh, just kind of pointing it out. So thank you. Mr. Douglas. Uh, thank you, Maria. Um, back on um, slide four, go back to that project, proposed project. If you see that, uh, when you see the street light there, it says the travel lanes and the bike lanes. Will this signal be bike friendly? So you have ropes that you have folks out on the road that there's a signal for them to give them a long time to get ahead of the traffic before traffic goes? Yeah, so um, what you're referring to is giving like a, a cue jump for a bike. Um, we are not putting those in right away because we don't have any totals on how many bikers may use this corridor at the beginning. But once we get some data, the signals are adaptable to be able to do something like that. So we're not installing them at the beginning, but certainly um, can come back and do that as we get enough volume of bikers to warrant that. All right, appreciate that, thanks. I just had a couple comments on the native grass. <clears throat> and I don't mind it, and I know the first couple of years it has to go to seed, so it can help reproduce itself. Quebec, this time of year, gets to start looking really shabby. 
Um, I, I look at it every time I come into City Hall, which is basically daily, and it gets three to four feet tall. And, you know, we're looking at the drawings, we see this nice short grass. When it gets waist deep, and, you know, I just want it to look nice, and I worry because you drive down Quebec, and Quebec looks great until you get to that native grass, and it just looks unmaintained. Mm. And so what we end up with is a lot of our residents saying, hey, look, <clears throat> You're not mowing your weeds. You know, you got a weed ordinance. I know it's native grass, and I know the city can call it whatever they want. At the end of the day, it's still really tall and starts getting really bushy. And my personal opinion is it doesn't look as nice as if it was maintained at least once a year to be cut down and, and be manageable. And you can do that after it seeds out without affecting the reproductive side of the native grass. And I couldn't let this go by without saying something because I'm noticing Quebec lately. And uh, <clears throat> it drives me crazy because we want that aesthetically pleasing corridor. At least that's my impression. Okay. The intent is for us to add that to our mowing cycle. So um, we have had discussions with the landscape architect about what is the right mix, something that won't uh, necessarily have to withstand a whole year to um, take, if you will, but something that we could mow on a regular basis. Good. Put Quebec on that mowing schedule too, please. All right. Uh, seeing no further questions or comments, do um, you have more to your presentation, Maria? Yep. Go ahead and continue. Okay. I'll just very quickly summarize the end here. Is just kind of our next steps is we do have about 80% plans completed. We are going to be going through a thorough review of those this Thursday with various utilities, including South Adams. And then we are working on um, the final design of those modified drainage improvements that we talked about um, at the end of June and starting to go about land acquisition. So our goal is to get go out for construction later this year sometime and that's subject to that uh, how well we do with land acquisition, of course, but that's still our goal right now is to get something out on the street and hopefully break ground before the end of the year. Great. Thank you very much. All right, before we go into the next item, I noticed there's some young kids in the audience. I um, was wondering if you'd come up to the podium for a minute. Come on up. Most of the time we don't have young children your age staying for an entire meeting talking about designs of roadways. And so you've been very well behaved uh, during our meeting and I've noticed that. Why don't you tell us your names? Go ahead. I'm Rachel Wolfersberger. Hi, Rachel. My name is Benjamin Wolfersberger. Okay. Young lady, you're going to need some help. Allison Wolfersberger. Nice. Are you here for anything particular tonight? School? Lay it on us. All right. So uh, I've been working on my communications mayor badge. I'm a scout. So, and this will also count for uh, citizenship in the community. So what I need to do is just take notes at a city council meeting, um, discuss all the things that are being talked about, and once I finish finished doing that, I'll be able to get my communications merit badge and my citizenship in the community merit badge. That's awesome. You know, here in Commerce City, we don't let young kids sit in the audience well behaved without saying something. And it's great that you're a scout. Um, I have to hand it to your little sisters, though. They're doing a great job of being nice and quiet so you can study. And and we're appreciative of the fact that you're a scout and you're, you're getting your citizenship badge. I did ask the staff to... Uh, Bring some backpacks down for you and your sisters for being so well behaved in the council meeting. <laughs> Good thing is you're spending time away from the, the cell phone, the TV, and all the electronics, and, and hopefully you're learning a little something. So I just wanted to thank you on behalf of the city for, for being well behaved and coming in here and, and getting an educational piece. And anytime you need to come back, we're here to help you with any of those badges you may need. Okay? Thanks, well, thank kids. You. Yes, sir. 
Oh, all right. Mr. Uh, Benson has something he wants to say yeah. to you. So what rank are you in the Boy Scouts? Um, well, just by yesterday, I became a Life Scout, so I'm working on my Eagle now. Awesome. All right. So do they still have citizenship in the nation and citizenship in the community? Oh, I got citizenship in the world and nation. I just have to work on right. uh, citizenship in the community. It was communications that I also have to work on. Well, about 61 years ago, I was doing the same thing, going to city council meeting. <laughs> 61 years ago. Well, good luck. Good luck. Thank you. There's some other folks that want to talk as well. I just think it's great. My son made it to life, and then he ended up getting the fume disease, and he never got his eagle, but he went to Australia for a month and toured all of the city councils in Australia, and all he had to do was fill out the paperwork. But the fume disease is what you have to watch out for. When you get to be your age, it starts affecting young men. And it has to do with car fumes and perfumes. <laughs> Stay away from that, okay? Sean, I need to say one Mr. Benson, you have something else? Yeah, I just want to say my, I stopped about five merit badges short of Eagle. And it's like um, the mayor says, um, I was a Boy Scout up until about the age of 14, and then I became a Girl Scout. <laughs> and I missed out on being an Eagle uh, by about five merit badges. So don't let this get to you. It's all keep about on, focus. Keep on until you get that Eagle designation. Right. Councilwoman Carson. Um, thanks for coming. I just have one question for you. Now that you've been here and you've seen the job, yep. the mayor's seat is open. Um, you would have to get a petition and get it turned in within the next few days if you're interested in running for mayor. Thanks, Councilman Carson. Awesome. You're kicking me to the curb. <laughs> That's great. I, I really wish you good luck. Please come back when you get your Eagle Scout so we can recognize you at this council meeting, okay? Thanks for being good, young ladies. Enjoy what's in the bag, and uh, you're welcome back anytime. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank now, you. that brightens our evening. Now we can get back into work and... We got something positive to think about. All right, thank you very much. All right, next item is a budget presentation. HR, community development, IT, legal, FS, Campo, PWPD, all of them. You're doing all of them in one night. All right, who's first? HR? Come on up. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. I'm going to be presenting the Human Resources Budget for 2016 and 17. And for the uh, viewing audience, I'm Kathy Blakeman. I have relatively no changes within my budget except for risk, and we're going to talk about that in a second. This is the core HR budget, and the line item there on salaries and benefits is strictly the tax and benefits increase that will... Uh, happen across time, so that's you're going to find pretty standard across all the other groups. Other than that, my line items are exactly the same as they were in prior years. This is the various divisions within my department. So the first one is human resources. That's the last slide that you just saw. Um, organizational development is the learning that we do for not only leadership but for the employees and I'm not asking for an increase in that we're doing some pretty good things with those dollars right now the employee appreciation committee those dollars are the same as the prior years at the 17.5 we're not asking for an increase there now risk is the place where we uh, have asked for increases and this has to do with a new safety slogan that we are um, that we have worked on with the communications department that we're ready to roll out and so we asked for some additional funding there, as well as some additional funding for a new safety incentive program that is just, completion, just being in completion right now for being designed as well. So that's what the uh, increase is there. And for the additional issues or key initiatives, so for 2016 HR, again, we're going to be covering everything within the existing budget that we have right now. We're doing some creative things. We're going to be relooking how we do performance management. There's some things we like about performance management in the organization, some things we want to change. Um, so one of the key things, of course, would be looking at the review process that we have and better training around doing um, reviews and setting goals. 
Organizational development is for leadership and for employees, and we're looking at doing a supervisor university. And that university will be banking off of, of some work that was done in some prior years, and so we would be using that as a starting point. We'll be doing some uh, informal 360s, and this is yet to be defined. We've not de decided exactly at what level we will be doing this, but it will be starting from the top. It may only include our uh, three top folks here, or it may actually uh, go down one level. We've not made a determination on that, but it will be informal, so it will not require any additional funding. And then also we're looking at the wellness, safety, and training and development programs. And they seem to be, they feel a little bit like they're standalone types of programs, but they're not. There's so many synergies that are starting to form and that can be found further. So we'll be doing some work with that as well. And with that, that's my budget for this year. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you. Does anybody have any questions on the HR budget? All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next is, uh, what do we got next? Community development, Chris. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Um, like HR, ours, uh, our budget is not uh, as complex as some of the other departments. Uh, and understanding you've got a lot to go through, we will run through community development's budget, proposed budget relatively quickly. Um, just as a big picture overview of the, dev the uh, department budget for community development, um, a majority of our budget is made up of uh, benefits and salaries. Uh, uh, we, have, we don't have as many other uh, resources or materials or uh, uh, equipment like some other departments like Public Works or the Police Department. Uh, the big changes that you can see in uh, um, this particular slide, we have had um, some service and charges uh, decrease uh, from some of the, the, uh, the budgets that are taken out, such as IT and, and fleet, and then we've had some small increases as a result of some changes that we've made in planning to allow for us to do some in-house plans. Um, sometimes when you do those plans, it, and when you contract out plans, sometimes you can incorporate the cost of making copies, producing books, hosting <coughs> neighborhood meetings. You can incorporate that into the charges of the consultant. If we do it in-house, we still have to find money to do all those things so that we get good public turnout and have out, uh, products. Um, the more detailed version here, the big takeaway I think you might be able to take away from this, we've actually, um, the net result will end up being the same, but you will notice the Neighborhood Services uh, 2016 budget being uh, uh, a lot less and the administration budget being a lot more. Uh, in an effort to consolidate the administrative division within community development, we basically have a single source for administrative support. Uh, it's part of our ongoing efforts to modernize the community development department. And so we've taken two positions and shifted them into an administrative uh, division. So there's not really a net result there. We're really just moving budgets from one place to another to, to further reflect the administration di uh, division that we have. The things that are a little bit different, so overall, uh, most of our budget, though, is remaining the same year over year. There are a couple of, of uh, noteworthy S aspects that we should talk about, key initiatives. Um, the URA, uh, sort of vis-a-vis -vis the Community Development Department, is uh, requesting uh, $100,000 for ongoing efforts and maintenance. As council slash URA board may re recall, there have been a number of ongoing efforts as it relates to mowing of the property. We have uh, some consultant fees to help us understand master developer agreements. Um, these aren't necessarily huge numbers, but they are continuing costs that we need to be able to account for. Um, a second item is a uh, land use case management software. Uh, currently right now, uh, we have six different land use case management software uh, used by the planning division. That's basically however the six different planners want to do their case management. They do it on their own uh, through Excel and any other ways that they can think of. Um, and it has led to sometimes a lack of consistency and, and there's opportunities for greater efficiency if we are able to get some software that standardizes those processes. Um, another element is the RTD grant match for the 104X. This is the last year of that grant match. Um, we've reported to council that the numbers for the 104X continue to be strong and they are continuing to go up um, and so we are lobbying RTD to make the 104X a part of their normal service. 
we will not have to pay for it, and it will continue to operate. In our latest, just in case council's curious, we're, uh, we actually think the numbers are there to justify an additional time, so to go from three to four, and then hopefully we would push the next year to go from four to five in our longstanding plan to take over the world. Um, we hope to then that becomes a daily service. You've got to do it one step at a time. You know, the one question I get, uh, A, compliments from the citizens that I talk to. Um, it seems like inevitably I'll, I'll find myself at 104th and Chambers watching the exodus of people get off the bus, and it's exciting to see that many people spill off of a bus um, in our community because it says we're taking that many cars off the road, which is fantastic. But the number one question I get from folks is, I want to take that bus downtown on the weekend. <laughs> and so, of course, uh, you know, in addition to those other times early and late in the day from a true commuter perspective. Um, obviously, folks are interested in what you know it would take to see that ex that service expand to weekends, at least a Saturday or we, something along those lines. We Special want them to services. be able to take that on the weekend too, right? right. And, and uh, we, we are having to get there. We've learned a lot about the RTD service operations for their buses. And, uh, it's a fascinating organization. So we're becoming a lot more adept, and I think the success we had with the 73 coming through the Prairie Gateway mm -hmm. in a couple of years is, a, is an example of that. We aren't going to be able to get there overnight, though. I can just right. tell you that based on what we've learned. Yep. And so I do think we're making great progress, and we're learning how to push the right buttons. And awesome. so uh, it's certainly our goal to get it there. We'd like to see daily service throughout the course of the whole day and weekend service. Sure. Thank you. And, and again, yes, absolutely want to recognize staff's efforts. It's We've come light years in a very short amount of time in terms of our bus bus efforts and bus advocacy. So thank you. Um, right. Two more quick items, and then All I'm right. I'm and out of your way. Question as soon as you're done. Um, we have a seventeen thousand uh, dollars that we're requesting for a uh, abatement property cleanup increase. There's already a budget line item for that. We're requesting to increase that by seventeen thousand. That's to basically take it back to a, the prior two years ago amount. Um, we had cut it by seventeen thousand in an effort to work with the overall budget numbers. And so we're requesting to take that back. Um, I can tell council that um, historically, it's an unpredictable budget line. Uh, some years we don't use it all, and then other years we could go well past it, but because the budget's not there, we have to stop. Typical things that we use the abatement for include uh, weeds when we have an unresponsive owner, boarding up of houses with an absentee, uh, landlord, and then in some worst case scenarios, demolition. Um, we were going to, uh, we had some real safety concerns with three houses down near Quebec and 57th. We were going to have to go well past last year's budget to do a demolition there. There was asbestos involved, which makes the numbers uh, shoot through the roof. Um, luckily, we didn't have to do that because they were able to sell it to a developer who came in and did that on their own. Uh, we may not always be that lucky every year. In 2011, we, um, we went 168% uh, above our allotted budget because of some life safety issues like that. So we're simply requesting it to come back up to the level it was before so we can be better prepared to handle these as they come up. Finally, the last thing is a $15,600 increase uh, to our outside services building permit review budget. Um, and this is one that is a little bit of uh, good news uh, uh, sort of uh, built within this number. Um, our building permit reviews are, are uh, maxing the system. So we, to keep up with our commitments to the development community and to builders, we, are, uh, we have a contract where we can ship out certain types of building permit reviews to a third party where they can review them, we can still meet our timelines, and people can still get their buildings built on time. Uh, we have gone over our budget the last two years. Um, a question council may have at this point is if we think these numbers are so high, why not just hire a person? Uh, we are wanting to still continue to be more conservative and make sure that these trends are going to stay this way and make sure that there's truly work for, for a third plans examiner. So, um, you know, that would represent a huge increase for our de department and we want to be more cautious than that. So this is a cost effective way to be able to keep up with the demands while making sure that from a budget perspective we're not overextended. So with that, that's that's all I have. All right. We'll go with uh, Mr. Douglas first. Uh, thank you, Chris, for your presentation. Um, with the new increase in permits for 2016, <clears throat> you think 15-6 is adequate? 
because there's a lot of dirt turning up there and a lot of new filings. And, and uh, based on our, this prior situation we have here uh, with one of our developers, um, it may make sense to increase that. So uh, we looked at, uh, if council may recall, uh, last year our residential building permit numbers did level out a little bit. Um, last year we saw a big increase though in the valuation, especially for commercial permits, which is really what caused us to go over last year. Okay. When we looked at this year as a tracking measure, um, we're sort of still, we're slightly above on the residential, but not so much so that it's, it, it, I think the, the increase that we've seen in the residential is really where we got this 15-6. Okay. Um, I, I think it's pretty good. If we get into a situation where we absolutely need to go beyond this, uh, we've done that the last two years. I don't want to say we're good at it, but we will, uh, we will, you know, our priority is to make sure that those permits get issued on time. And so when we need to go over it, we will, and then we will find a way to adjust the budget accordingly. Okay. Um, we're, I, I think this is a good number, though. All right. And last year, what was that, what was that budget amount for permits? Um, let me look here. Two seconds. Armando, if you beat me to it, you can certainly... Reading glasses. It's just the increase. Give me just a moment. I apologize. You came up here thinking it was going to be as easy as Maria's, didn't you? Or as HR's? Well, I, you know, I, I like the. The, the interesting part of this is you never know which part of, might generate the questions. So. Yep. Steve, you're talking about just residential permits? The combination of construction just, there. Just a second. I, I think Chris is going to use a lifeline and go to the city manager for phone a friend or something. Here. Well, I do, I do not know the answer to that question, <laughs> but I was just simply gonna, going to note uh, that the money that's spent on these outside services is offset with a revenue that's collected for uh, building permits. Uh, so if we don't send the plans out for review, we certainly keep that revenue. But if the expense goes up, it means the revenue is going up. Just wanted to point that out. So what was last year? I remember I had a bet with Jim, and I think it was like 390-some single-family homes. I think it was 380-something, uh, just, just under 390. And we're, we're tracking about that level, maybe a little under that this year. Right. I told him it would break 400 IOM lunch. And it didn't break 400, so I know it was up in that 390 range because it was close. Yeah. Hold on, just two seconds. That's what you said five minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so last year the budget amount was um, 15, uh, 400, so we're actually just proposing to double that number. So last year we actually spent 67979 which is a 441% overage over what we budgeted. So this year we're already at um, 22000 So again, I think the numbers are certainly justifying, from our perspective, a recommendation for a budget increase, but we still don't think we're there to the point where it justifies an additional person. All right. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Uh, let's see, we have some more here. Councilwoman Carson. Thanks for the presentation. I hope my answer is easier for you. Uh, on this abatement for property cleanup, do we try to get reimbursed for that from property owners? Yes. And are we successful in that area? Eventually. It could be a few years down the road uh, as a tax lien, and sometimes those property sales don't occur for a while. Um, but we are we, we, we eventually get that money back. 
And then in, in parts of our city where uh, neighborhoods are taken care of by HOAs, do we have that issue in there, or is that up to the HOA? Or? Historically, abatements, for the most part, have only been used, uh, let me rephrase that, mostly been used in the core city. We have had some weed abatements that we have done in the Northern Range, especially if you recall a number of years ago when uh, we had properties that were people were moving out in the middle of neighborhoods and some of the weeds were getting extremely tall and there were a couple of really problem properties and there was a sort of a vacant lot with an absentee owner. So we did do a few abatements there, but by far most of them are in the core city. Okay, thank you. Told you it'd be easier. All right, Mr. Amador. Chris, thank you for uh, being here and asking for the increase in the outside services and building permit review, um, recognizing uh, what is going on in the trend of uh, the commu our community in general, but also other jurisdictions. What I can tell you is that um, it's systemic across all of Colorado, especially with the booming economy that we have, and we're one of the fastest rebounding uh, companies from the recession. Um, so I, I'm glad to see that you're asking for that 15 to 6 back. Um, if you need, in my opinion, if you need more than that, it would be uh, good for you to ask now or if you think you need more um, just to provide the level of service from plan review because a lot of times um, there are challenges getting permits from uh, the municipality that, that needs to get done and a lot of people get agitated and I, I do get a lot of feedback on our planning department and uh, the things that are coming out of the building department as well um, and we are trying to provide the best level of service so thank you. Well, Mr. Mayor if I could just um, the, the dollar amount that we proposed I completely understand the desire uh, to make sure that we are doing enough there. But just to give a little context of why we aren't necessarily asking for a ton uh, on this line item, uh, just in 2012, which is not very long ago, it's also sort of a commentary on the rebound that you're referring to, but in 2012, we only spent half of the budget for that line item. So in just two short years is really we've seen this, this sharp increase. We want to make sure that we are being responsible with the budget and we're asking for what we think is an appropriate amount. We will obviously analyze this year and, and when we come back next year we'll, we'll continue to analyze it. But it's such a short time frame, we would hate to overdo it. I only have one thing, Chris, on that subject. Um, if things continue to, to recover the way they've been recovering and you find yourself in a pinch, um, we want to make sure that we provide those services. So I would hope midterm that you would come back to us and say, hey, you know what, we're, we're to that point. We've got to have another person. I don't want you to try to stumble through the rest of the year if you need somebody. So I just want to make sure that we're providing that service that Mr. Amador has just talked about um, so that we don't get behind the eight ball for, for months because you don't have the resources you need. Well, just to clarify, we have not held on to a permit because we ran up against the top of our budget line. We've continued sure. to send those out on time and just found other ways to fund that. Sure. Well, and I just want to make sure you have those resources to be able to manage the permitting side of the community. so that Because the only calls that the council receives are the ones where someone's snagged up on something, they're having problems, because you know we refer them to you. You know what those are. I just want to make sure that if you're running into an issue of being able to get, you know, your analysis done properly, that we know you need some extra money and that you and the city manager come and say, hey, um, business is good and we need more people to handle the permitting or whatever it may be. All right? Anyone else? Seeing none, thanks for, for, thanks for the presentation. <clears throat> All right, IT, you're up. Doug, with his first budget presentation. First time, yeah, be nice. <clears throat> Good luck. Figure out how to work the mic first. Thank you. Um, good evening, uh, Mayor, Council Member. Uh, it's a pleasure, actually, to be here for my first time. Um, and I want to thank you all for your support going 
uh, back over my last 20 years in IT, and I'm pleased to say that um, I think we're in a pretty good position um, going forward in, in terms of IT infrastructure. So with that, I'll jump in. I know you, you get a lot of information, and your time is uh, important tonight, so we'll try to be brief and, and get through this. Um, this is our overall department budget. Uh, it, basically, it's a, it's a close to flat budget with some enhancements for uh, GIS, and I'll talk about that later. Um, in terms of increases on line items, our, our salaries are essentially flat. Basic, those are cost of living increases and some other adjustments. We squeeze a little bit more out of our materials and supplies. Um, you'll see a, um, an increase in our, our services um, and charges of 18000 The majority of that is, is an enhancement we asked for for GIS, and I'll explain that in a little bit. And then our, our capital outlays, which is our... Uh, our retained earnings and what we use to uh, maintain and, and upgrade our existing technology infrastructure is is essentially uh, flat or flat. It's gone up uh, about uh, 2.3 percent. Um, this is by division. Um, the uh, the bulk of uh, uh, the increase is in operations, and then, and then you can see GIS, where we're doing some enhancements for GIS. We squeezed a little bit out of uh, administration, and a lot of that was due to consolidation of cell phones. Um, as far as significant line item increases, um, the, the salary increases, we're asking, I talked about GIS, two things we're doing for GIS. First of all, we asked for an increase for our interns, uh, uh, the, the dollar amount, hourly amount we were playing for our interns for GIS was not competitive in the market. So we asked for an increase for that as an enhancement so that we could, um, every year when interns, interns are a good value, we think, for the city in terms of GIS, especially a lot of the back-end um, work that's done to, pro to provide that valuable data for the maps you have. So this allows us to be competitive in the market. Um, the other significant increase you'll see is uh, an increase in consulting for GIS. One of our major initiatives is to review our GIS initiative, make sure we've, we've got um, current, t taking advantage of current technology and we're providing the right GIS for Commerce City. And um, we've asked for a little bit of consulting help to, to look at um, best practices for somebody our size. To do that is one thing, and also some of that consulting money will be used for those back-end projects to help support support that effort. Um, we did see some increases in uh, network um, software maintenance. I'm sorry, application software maintenance. Um, the trend that I'm seeing right now is everybody wants a contract that has an annual 5% increase in software. Um, we try to, we push back and try to negotiate on, on that, but we did see some increase in our um, app, the application software that we maintain. And same thing on the uh, network software side. That's the software generally we use to maintain back-end systems like security systems. One of the big increases there was uh, when we renewed our spam filtering and email filtering. Um, we had a three a really good three-year deal. That, that deal was over, and, and, um, and we had a pretty, pretty high increase in that. Um, but overall, we, we managed to, to stay fairly flat. Um, so key initiatives for IT, uh, since I've uh, come on board as interim, I've been um, able to work um, with council on their city goals and, and working very hard to get our uh, performance plan in line with those city goals. First goal, always one of our goals, is to continue to provide available, reliable, and secure technology platform. And the internal service fund allows us to fund the upgrades and technology. We need to do that. Some key initiatives there are, are we are at a point where we're, we're going to be doing a major upgrade to our network and phone system. Um, and believe it or not, it's uh, more than some, a lot of our components that we brought from the old build, building are up to 10 and 14 years old. We're starting to reach end of life there, and it's time for us to do a refresh. Um, same thing with messaging. Our email system is due for an upgrade. We're looking at... Um, different solutions there, possibly cloud-based solutions for our messaging infrastructure. Um, data storage, same story. Um, 
that was uh, that those components are um, end of life. We continue to squeeze um, more service out of them, but but we've got to make sure we take care of that reliable piece. And then lastly, um, we've asked for IT um, service management um, software to actually manage IT in, in our our calls. We've used a conglomeration of um, access databases, spreadsheets, um, CR systems. The, the gentleman who kind of put that together is, has retired, and so some of the support for how those systems work is, is no longer there, and it's really time for us to, to um, move, get a system that will help us be more efficient, actually. That's the goal of that system. Um, we'll be able to get um, better data on how our systems are performing and how our folks are performing as we move forward. Um, we want to continue to advance our systems integration. I talked about improving our GIS data delivery. That's a major initiative for us. Um, we're working on, um, you know, IT supports all the other departments really in your council goals, and we do a lot of work there. One of the things we do is help with uh, business process analysis, and that's an important effort. And then one of my, um, my initiatives is to do some more longer-term strategic planning from an IT perspective. We have an infrastructure plan that's, that we, we, um, we use to, to feed our budget this year. We need to, get, um, we need to do long-term planning for our application development our, and our services and our security planning. And then at the bottom, you see the two enhancements I talked about uh, for GIS. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll stand for questions. I don't see any, Doug, but, you know, I'm, I, I am, I am going to ask you, how safe is our system? Uh, I mean, our security, are we good, up to date? Uh, we are um, up to date. Um, we have, uh, two years ago, we did a security audit, and we just reviewed that recently. We've uh, made a lot of efforts there. I think security is critical. Um, security is a... a posture and we need to continually monitor that and improve our systems. I think we've got some, some pretty good systems in place, um, but we certainly need to address um, address that right now and continue to address it going forward. Well, that, that's why I'm asking because it just seems, you know, it was a couple years ago we did the security audit and with technology today you see all over people getting into personal information, that kind of stuff. I just want to make sure that the information, the residential information, the city's information is secure and that you're maintaining that security piece. We are, we, we are doing everything that was recommended in that audit or have looked at how we're going to do that, and we continue to evaluate that. Um, unfortunately, the, the security threat, as you may have noticed nowadays, is, is increasing, and, and DOD's not, I mean, they're secure, right? So how secure are they? We will continue to monitor that. Um, and, and continue to do best practices. And I think because council has provided the resources in terms of our internal service fund to, to put those systems in place and replace them, I think we can continue to, to maintain a, a good security posture is what I would, I would say. All right, thanks. Um, let's see, Mr. Douglas. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, thank you uh, so much for IT for what they do. Um, I know that uh, a lot of things we don't see you know, as far as spam and all that, things are filtered out, and uh, I do appreciate the level of security. Um, just a question on the on the GSI interns: What is the market rate for hourly intern for GIS? Um, I, and I apologize; I don't have that off the top of my head. Um, we would; uh, it, it was about four dollars more than what we we budgeted for. Yeah. Um, we. Um, we will pay the market rate to get an intern in. This allows us to have, it's, it's budgeted for two. If the market rate's down a little, we might have a little few more hours for intern uh, or something along those lines. So, um, but I apologize for not having the exact number. If, uh, I'd be happy to get that to you um, afterwards if you'd like. Right, I, I know most places hire interns during the summer month when school's not in. And, and some with, uh, that are going are in college, um, so I, I appreciate that. Maybe uh, next week, or so we can get that number for the hour. I, I will follow up direct, 
with permission directly with you, Councilman. Okay. Well, I, I will say our intern program has been, um, you guys know Kirk Hare, and we've been using interns for almost as long as I can remember, and, and we get a lot of great um, uh, work behind the scenes, as you said, out of that program. And every year, uh, there's a lot of competition, actually, for the GIS interns that come out of the various programs around the city. So hopefully this will help us continue that program. All right, Mr. Amador. Doug, I'll be brief. Um, I know this is a budget meeting, but I do want to take the opportunity to thank you and your staff for keeping us spam free. I know that there were uh, a couple of websites that people signed us up for um, as the whole council and the whole country could spam us when we went through this uh, Chloe dog incident and, uh, you know, Hammy the pig incident. And so we talk about livestock and all these other things going on. So um, I do want to thank you for that and your responsiveness and um, just thank you. I take no exception to your budget. Well, thank you. All right. Seeing no one else. Thanks, Doug. Thank, thank you. you. All right, and we'll go to financial. No, legal. Legal's legal next. Bob. Uh, for those citizens that are observing these proceedings, my name is Bob Gaylor. I'm city attorney for the city of Commerce City, and I'll be presenting the uh, legal department budget. Uh, you see on the, on the screen a summary of what my budget uh, looks like for, for this year. Also, it tells you what it was last year in 2015. The, the bulk of the increase was the result of um, salaries and benefit increase that the City Council directed uh, take place in my office as a result of increase in hours on the part of the, uh, the City Attorney, as you recall. That's the bulk of the, the number, and the next slide will tell us in more detail, and this slide that you have in front of you is the one I want to address. So for personnel services, you'll see the, uh, the number that includes uh, my two attorneys that work with me, and I want the council to know that those two attorneys are doing an excellent job for us. Uh, they are, they're each assigned certain departments in the city, and that process has been worked at, working out very well for us. Each one is responsible for certain departments, and I oversee those uh, workings and make sure that those departments are well represented. In addition, I have an uh, administrative assistant who's been with me for 18 years, so she knows uh, exactly what what's expected of her, and uh, she does an excellent job, too. So all in all, I think our uh, legal services for the city uh, are in good hands. The materials and supplies that you see, that simply refers to uh, the uh, supplies that we need for the transaction of business in our office. You see there's a slight drop from last year, and the reason for that is because we're using the numbers that were actual as a result of expenditures made, and we didn't spend $1,600 in 2015, or haven't, it doesn't appear that we're going to, so projecting that number to uh, 2016, you see a slight drop in materials and supplies. Services and charges, <clears throat> you'll see a, a decrease there. Uh, what that entails is the uh, uh, the allocation of um, uh, it's the legal portion of uh, the facility services that are provided to my office. It includes the, uh, the allocation of computer services, computer allowances. It includes um, the uh, training and league dues. Uh, that is required to be paid uh, on behalf of my attorneys. Uh, the, there is no capital outlay, and the, uh, as you'll see then, the total budget is, uh, includes the outs outsourcing of legal fees, and that, that expense is, is sizable. Uh, I kept it 
basically the same as 2015. Uh, you'll see $217,575 is allocated for that. That includes uh, when we hire outside attorneys for uh, any legal work that is to be accomplished, such as the DIA expenses that we have incurred considerably this year. Uh, it also includes uh, the city's share of the uh, legal services for the attorney that was hired on behalf of the uh, Adams County Coordinating Committee, uh, in addition to the legal services for the attorney that's been assisting me in the uh, proceedings with the IA. Also includes the water attorney, uh, who is uh, an experienced water attorney. He's done an excellent job for us through the years. He's represented us for a number of years. Paul Zylas is his name. Some of you may know him. Uh, in addition, the legal services include the uh, services for outside litigation expenses involved with our sales and use tax litigation. And that's the, what our $217,000 is incurred for. Frankly, that money is, in my opinion, well spent because without those outside services, my, my office would not be equipped to handle those outside services that the city requires, namely water services. The, uh, the DIA expenses, uh, I'm being optimistic, but I'm expecting that those services are going to pretty much come to a halt in the near future, at least for outside services, because the, the Denver portion of the, uh, of the negotiations has been completed uh, pending a vote to take place this November. So the services we're talking about is just internal between the, the cities and the Adams County. And I'll be handling those proceedings and we will not require outside help, outside legal services involving those proceedings. We use that. A, uh, and a Denver attorney that had a lot of experience with Denver in the past. In fact, he was a former Denver city attorney who represented us in the DIA proceedings uh, involved negotiations with Denver, and I think that worked out very well for us. So the bottom line is just what you'll see there uh, as far as the budget is concerned. And let's go to the next slide then. Uh, and actually, that's the conclusion because we're not asking for any additional items such as uh, any line items, uh, additional requests. Uh, and that's why you don't see an additional <laughs> slide up there for that. Uh, and I've covered pretty much what we what the budget is expected to be in 2016. So I'm open for any questions. All right. Any questions for Bob on the budget for the legal department. I just have to say, Bob, you know, David Fine and Paul Zylas and those guys, I know they do a lot for us. And, you know, we don't see that broke out in there, but we know that's where a lot of those expenses come from. And I think we were very wise to have David Fine as a part of our team with the whole DIA negotiations. Um, it put us uh, a better place at the table. So... And I will add to that, he was a, a real gentleman to work with. Uh, whenever uh, I requested something of him, he was always quick to respond, and I think uh, it was money well spent having him on board with us. And uh, I think our, the result of our negotiations have, have been very successful. Yeah, we can only hope that now the vote the vote will happen and we won't have to incur those kind of expenses for the DIA stuff anymore. Thank you. All right. You. Anyone else? Seeing no one. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. All right. Now we'll go to finance department. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, I'll be doing the, fi the finance department presentation. So the department summary, um, overall we looked at 2015 and if you look at 2016, overall we had a 3.3 increase. That was due to salary 
and uh, material and supply. It was all due to allocations from um, switching some of our positions and then also our services and charges, which included a 5% increase on uh, the medical uh, insurance. For the division summary, we had a, so I'm going to go over each, I have five departments or five divisions that I have to go over. Um, the internal services were a lot of the, the money or a lot of the movement we've seen. Um, we did have some changes with the insurance, which if you take a look at uh, material and supply, or I'm sorry, um, services and charges, we had an increase there. And we also take a look at material and supply, there was a 50, or a 19,000 um, difference and that was included. Uh, we allocated our cell phone equipment from the other departments into the internal service um, division, which we saw a four point or a four percent change um, over last year. And then, if you look at the the court, um, we are pretty flat. Um, if you take a look at it, everything was pretty much from last year, um, and so it was pretty flat. Point eight per, or zero point eight percent change and if you look at the finance services uh, so I'm going to lump some of the finance services with the fi uh, financial planning and budgeting and the tax so there's a lot of movement if you take a look we had a 4% on the fi uh, financial services we had a 24% decrease with the finance or financial planning and budgeting and then with an 11% tax we uh, we actually looked at our, pos our position budgeting looked at our positions and we allocated the positions correctly to different departments originally we had them all in finance planning and budget and as you can see the decrease at 24% so we moved them to the uh, the correct uh, divisions um, significant line item variances uh, the only major increase that we we seen or variance was the internal services and that was the health insurance increase uh, we did a uh, it was Recommended a 5% increase. And that's all I have. Do you have any questions? You went through, through that pretty quick. That did, that did yeah. that pretty quick. <laughs> yeah. You're going to have to ask Cheryl why she threw you under the bus. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, um, Council, do you have any questions about the Finance Department budget? Mr. Amador? Just one question on the health insurance uh, increase. And so that was a uh, increase um, in premiums or can you speak a little bit about that yeah so um, it's an increase in premium um, they looked at we're looking at different vendors um, it was a year to look at different vendors including the vendor that we have now um, and all of them were very identical it was about a five percent increase uh, if we go with a different vendor or we stay with our current vendor it was about five percent increase um, <coughs> trying to lock us in at a two-year rate and so we switched our health insurance provider? No, we haven't switched our health insurance provider. We just got, uh, they went out and did a quote for vendors to see if we're within the market. Um, so ours actually increased currently, our vendor, and therefore we just went out and priced it, and we're about 5% increase if we stay with our vendor or we, if we used to go with another vendor. Thank you. Anyone else? Saying no one else, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now for the tough one, city manager's office. Good evening, mayor and council. The city manager's office's budget expert, Lisa Gallegos, could not be here tonight. I will tell you up front, I am a poor substitute. Uh, Lisa knows this information forwards and backwards. I'll give you an overview of the budget and then uh, we'll do our best to answer questions. The summary page indicates uh, uh, the overall change to our department budget year over year, we're uh, anticipating a 3.4% increase. The city manager's office organizationally and for budget purposes actually includes four divisions, uh, the administration division, city clerk's office, communications and intergovernmental relations, and economic development. You can see the anticipated changes across all four divisions along the bottom line. Some of our significant uh, additional requests are additional funds for federal and state lobbying. Uh, we found that our uh, expenses on the federal level have been running a little bit uh, higher uh, than what they had in previous years, and we've seen a consistent need for some specialized help on state issues. So we believe this additional $21,000 will be more in line with what our anticipated expenses would be for 2016. 
We've also included in the budget at City Council's request additional funding for additional telephone town halls in 2016. Other line item variances within the budget, these are not necessarily increases. Most of these line item variances uh, were able to uh, meet the need in the department by moving money around uh, within the various line items within uh, department and division budgets. So you can see uh, the changes year over year that we considered significant on these various line items. We'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, some of these are the result of anticipated expense increases. Uh, others are uh, related to, uh, again, federal and state lobbying uh, that I mentioned earlier. We are not proposing any budget reductions. Again, we are constantly uh, adjusting individual line items to be more in line with actual and anticipated expenses. And like the other departments, our goal is to align our work and uh, our budgeted expenses with accomplishing key objectives uh, in the administrative work plan. Some of our key initiatives in the city manager's office for 2016, additional work on documenting administrative policies. We have a number of policies throughout the organization. We have a considered effort going on at the present time to better document those policies. Uh, Roger has been spear, uh, spearheading our organizational development work with a tremendous amount of support from Kathy Blakeman and the team in HR. We are uh, working at better aligning our work plan with city council goals and developing measurable outcomes of that work so we can better track the progress that we're making. Uh, I mentioned the increased funding for additional telephone town halls. I think I, I heard from each one of you uh, support for that way of better engaging with our community. And so we've planned for six in 2016. The economic development team will be increasing their emphasis on business retention and expansion and enhanced efforts in our small business development center along with uh, our continued efforts towards retail development. Additionally, we have issued a request for proposals for a citywide document management system. Uh, we don't yet know if that's something that we will be tackling in 2016. We're just in that RFP process. Uh, to do an assessment at the present time. Uh, so it's possible we may be uh, looking at a document management system in 2016. So those are our key initiatives. Happy to answer any questions you have about the city manager's office's department budget. All right, council, you have any questions for the city manager on his budget? Saying none, oh, Mr. Douglas. Thank you, Brian. I just had a question on the town hall, telephone town hall. Is there another one slated for this later this year? I don't believe so, but I'm going to, Ms. Halstead is watching upstairs. She will text me the answer momentarily, so I'll chime back in when I hear back from Michelle. I, I don't recall if we have another one scheduled this year. All right. So that seemed that line item, it said 8,000, and then we're asking for 6,000 more for a total of six. So I thought maybe there was... Some more coming up. Yeah. I understood. Uh, looks like we have another one planned for October. So that would okay. be the second one for this year, uh, two this year, uh, six total next year. If right. I'm Thank you. Doing the math correctly. Okay. Appreciate good, it. Good question, Mr. Douglas. You got the city manager to use a lifeline and phone a friend. That's how it's supposed to work. <clears throat> All right. Next uh, presentation is going to be public works. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. I'm pleased to be here tonight to present the Public Works budget to you that stays essentially flat while also providing a high level of service. So Public Works at its core is about asset management and ser providing service. So when you think about all the assets that we're responsible for, the roads, sidewalks, traffic signals, the buildings, all of the city's equipment, um, it really is adds up to more than hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars that we're tasked with maintaining and managing. And then from a service provider aspect, uh, our big programs, of course, are snow plowing, the garbage and recycling program, and street sweeping. So in, uh, our budget is really focused on how do we incorporate efficiencies 
and increase effectiveness while providing those services into everything that we do, and then while also utilizing technology and uh, using innovative approaches to do things better. So with that, you can see our uh, roughly $11.5 million budget uh, stays relatively flat. And this breaks out just a couple of highlights here within the various divisions. Uh, you can see that the fleet budget is, has increased significantly. So again, being proactive about all of our assets, um, our fleet, as we've analyzed that over the last year, we've seen a need to increase the number of vehicles that we've replaced. We've taken a fairly, um, it's, I think the budget's been roughly around 1.2 to 1.4 million over the last three to four years. And what we're seeing in the fleet itself is that a need to replace many more of those vehicles than we have at the rate we've been doing. So that roughly 889,000 increase is to replace additional vehicles that have be gone beyond their useful life. And a good majority of that is within the police department. Not so much the patrol vehicles, but more with the detective and administrative units. Um, some of the additional requests, again, focusing on knowing what we have and managing those assets, is about uh, Highway 2. As we've taken that over, we know we're going to have additional lane miles to maintain. So there will be additional de-icing material necessary. Uh, we did get through that, the purchase or the devolution from CDOT. We were able to use that money for an additional plow, so that will be purchased this year. But we need the materials to go with it to make sure that we're uh, plowing that to a high level of effectiveness. And then the um, mayor is very familiar with this looking also not just internally at how we can provide service, but utilizing some of our uh, co-agencies uh, co to provide service. So you, working with Adams County, we are going to be spraying this fall. We're going to be utilizing funds that are already within the budget, but if we spray twice next year, we know that we have to increase the budget to account for that. And then finally, all of the um, costs associated with the leisure pool, the water, the HVAC, the gas and electric, telephone, all of that. We're trying to get just a baseline uh, for these last couple of months, knowing going into 2016 for a full year of service, how much is that actually going to cost the city? So that's within our facilities budget. Um, significant line item variances, again, just the highlights here. Our, we see those savings. So we never amended the budget for garbage and recycling last year. That's why you still see a very large decrease in 2016 for garbage and recycling services. And then, um, again, that 800 and nearly $889,000 increase for vehicle replacements to try and be more proactive and get more of those vehicles switched out. And with that, our, our, again, our focus for next year is continuing with knowing what we have, so inventorying what we actually have, and then planning out our work and really then working our plans. So very ha being very conscious of what we have and sticking to it so that we can provide consistent service. A couple of other highlights there is really looking at the automation. So automatic vehicle locating actually puts a GPS unit on the vehicles themselves. So we're able to um, not only see where they are out in the field, but we're also think, able to measure things like plow up, plow down, when they're, how fast they're going, so it's a safety issue as well, as well as how much material they're placing on the roadway so that we can get consistent patterns and we're not applying too much or too little of the DIC material. Um, also focusing on our storm sewer mapping and creating more of an improved maintenance plan. So. Uh, as we went through the floods in 2013 and then all the uh, efforts with Fairfax Park, remember that we didn't have a real good handle on what our storm sewer mapping was and where everything was flowing. So we're trying to incorporate that better, doing that work in-house and working with the GIS department to really get a better mapping system so that we can then go out and maintain it. And finally, uh, just hi highlight a couple of things there. We want to increase recycling efforts at all of our city buildings. So putting out just more containers so that we do collect those uh, materials so that you have an option as to where you want to put your pop can instead of having to throw it in the trash. Um, and then finally looking at incorporating some different types of vehicles into our fleet. 
So vehicles where maybe people are stopping or going, not necessarily our, our patrol vehicles, but certainly let's say neighborhood services or some of our public works inspectors could definitely benefit from an electric or a CNG, uh, which is compressed natural gas vehicles. And those facilities that are um, like CNG are becoming more and more available, so it does become a viable option for us to consider. So with that, I'll stand for any questions. Okay. Mr. Douglas. Thank you, Maria, for your presentation. Hey, I was just um, asking about the garbage recycling program. I know when we went for that, that um, service, um, I thought the savings was like 600 or some thousand. Is this showing uh, at 476,000 and then there was an increase someplace else to reflect Correct. savings? Correct. So in 2015, there was a $600,000 savings. And there's um, a provision within the contract that it goes up by the um, CPI or con uh, Consumer Price Index. So we estimated it to be 4%. So that's a relatively conservative. Um, but it will be increased automatically by that CPI. So that's why you see a slightly less um, increase, as well as new customers coming on board. So we've had a roughly four to 400 new homes that obviously increases the cost for that program as well. Okay, thank you. All right, Mr. Bullock. Yes, thank you for your um, report and everything. And uh, I have a couple questions. On the Paradise Island, the $95,000, I thought that the o &M came out of the 2K project, so we wouldn't, is that budget item part of 2K? that you have in here? Yes, it, it'll, it will, the funding source will be 2K. I just listed it out as an increase to the overall facilities budget. Okay. Okay. It's budget, not source. Okay. Yeah. And on electric vehicles, you're talking about exploring that possibility. Are we going to start putting charge stations in different parts around the city to accommodate the electric vehicles. And what would be the cost of charge stations? Not necessarily. We feel that there's enough um, of those facilities available to make that, again, viable without us having to provide our own charging stations. But that would be part of our, what we'll look into is, does that really make sense? So at this time, we're not anticipating us constructing or installing electric charge stations. Where is the nearest electric charge station there's uh, one down at the, um, I believe it's that, it's uh, one of those stations down on Quebec, on the south end of Quebec. And then I believe there's one up around the um, 96th and Highway 2 area as well. Okay. Uh, I will, I'm glad you said that. So when I get my Tesla, I'll know where to go. <laughs> All right, Mr. McElderney. Thank you. Uh, a, a comment, a compliment, I should say. I appreciate the innovation. You used that term uh, in regard to your your budget earlier, and I think it's evident in the approaches that are being taken. I appreciate the uh, the openness, and I think I hope I can speak for all of us that um, this is one of those areas, as we've heard on several comments tonight, where there are certain things we get called about, and they're often public works matters mm -hmm. and. Um, you and your team have been a fantastic partner in helping to jump in when we get concerns or questions about whether it's refuse or potholes or roads or otherwise. And I think um, that's important to say. I think the, the budget, as you've outlined it, and the projects and the focus areas help reiterate and sort of uh, spotlight that focus on finding ways to do more, not necessarily just do more, do more with less, or assume that what we're doing is the right way to do it. There's a clear sense of actively looking at are we doing the right things the right way at the right time, that, that sort of cycle of thinking. And I, I, I personally thank you for that. I know I've heard it from others on council, and it, it is um, incredibly nice when I'm talking to a citizen and I can say with a straight face and a high level of confidence that I have faith in what's happening with public works, and I can, I can, uh, I can speak with confidence. We obviously had a bumpy period just before, and as you were coming on, and we're still feeling the ramifications with 
some of the uh, the practices that um, were in place, and it's I think it's been fantastic to see two years now of our new uh, pavement management program in place. And I don't know that any single one of us has had a single question or comment or concern about the new methods that are being employed um, to take care of our and prolong the life of our streets. So I, I know that's a, a ramble, but thank you. Thank and you. Um, I appreciate the partnership for, on, on our be collective behalf. So thank you. In terms of the um, vehicle technology, I can't remember if we've, we've mentioned this before, but uh, when I had come out of the, the NREL Energy Leadership Program a few years back, one of the things that was really intriguing to me at the time was the, the service that NREL offers in terms of vehicle and fleet analysis and looking at what your needs are and helping to identify what the what the right mix is and they I was actually just sitting here looking um, and they'll actually go into looking at delivery vans and trash trucks and school buses the whole thing but um, that as Steve said earlier right the technology is evolving so quickly that being able to leverage an entity like NREL to help look at needs uh, the modeling tools that they have etc are, are really um, something for us to consider um, they had, and I haven't been up to the, the latest iteration of this, but they literally had implemented an entire war room, if you will. So if, if we were to engage with them, literally imagine this sort of CSI-like wall of, of monitors where they can cut and slice and dice and look at any number of different factors and, and models to help look at what makes sense. Um, and they can do that on the built environment as well. So it may be something that as we're exploring that, <clears throat> at least... Uh, give it a look um, to see what they might be able to do. And um, Carol Tambari would be a good person to reach out to just for a, an entree. She's their intergovernmental, intergovernmental relations. I have lost the ability to talk with braces, and it's really frustrating. Um, anyway, Carol is great and uh, would be a good person to reach out to to um, see what they might be able to help look into. Great. All right, Mr. Douglas. Uh, just one more comment, uh, Maria. I see that um, that the AVL automatic vehicle location on snowplows. That's uh, that'd be that's gonna be great to have, so you can exactly see what's going on in our city um, at a remote location. So, thank you very much for introducing that. I just have a couple of things, Maria. <clears throat> First of all, after last year's debacle with Chip Seal, I have to tell you I have not received one complaint about the slurry, slurry seal that's going in. Um, seems like everybody likes it. The roads look great, um, but I'm not getting those calls about I've got tar in my house, up my driveway, um, rocks. Last year was tough. This year, seems like our pavement management has been just a dream, and, and I, I thank you for that. <clears throat> I wanted to ask you, where are we at in the hiring process for a city engineer? Can you, because we don't know. And, and just been out of out of wonder where we're at with that that position. Certainly, yeah, it has been uh, quite a long time. So it was May of last year um, since we've had uh, since our city engineer retired, and really we're looking for the right person. So as I continue to say, we're not going to settle. Um, we have a very challenging CIP program. Uh, besides all the other things that we're trying to do within engineering, um, given all the development, of course, we do all the uh, inspections out there for those new uh, residential developments when they occur and so we need the right person and uh, we just haven't found them yet we are we did go through another round of interviews last um, week and I'm hopeful that one of those will step forward as a good candidate for us and hopefully within the next couple of months we should have somebody on board all right and then uh, the other question is when you talk about fuel alternative vehicles um, you know, I worked in the Public Works Department for 10 years, and at one point in time, to meet certain grant opportunities or, or whatever the, the rule was, uh, as a municipality, we had to have so many um, fuel alternative vehicles within the fleet. I don't know if we're still limited to having a certain amount, but we did have some CNG vehicles. And I'll have to tell you, I, I drove one of those CNG vehicles a lot. Um, we used it mostly for weed spraying, things like that, through Public Works. And I'll have to tell you, even though that was 20-some years ago, that vehicle 
operated just the same as a, a, a regular gas vehicle. You couldn't tell the difference in performance. The downside was you had to go clear across town to be able to refuel it. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was frustrating. And then the other benefit of it was when you ran out of CNG, you flipped a switch and it started running off of regular fuel until you got back to the fueling station. So hopefully now that you say fueling stations are becoming more available, I know after 20 years the technology's had to improve. Um, you know, it had a big tank in the back and, and, you know, we called it the bomb truck or something because it was just different to everybody. We didn't, you know, it wasn't a normal thing. But I, I wanted to know if you could talk to um, federal or state requirements for alternative fuel vehicles in a fleet for a municipality if there's a requirement. Certainly, yeah. And there are grant opportunities available. They're getting less and less just because that technology is out there so much. Um, but certainly uh, SAP Brothers has reached out to us because they're, they've incorporated a CNG facility. Um, waste management, of course, is doing that with all of their big vehicles. So I think as it gets more prevalent, um, there's not so much grants available, but I think it just makes more sense from us, just from an economic standpoint, where we don't necessarily see it in the purchase of the vehicle, but we save it on the fuel in the end. Um, and so it's, we're, we'll, our evaluation is really going to be not about, you know, is it just cool to have some alternative vehicles, but does it really make sense for our fleet and in what uses? Well, and I, I think it shows best practices for the rest of our, our residents. Um, if we're doing things like that. And I, I have heard that, I believe it's using Union Pacific's going to change over all their engines to CNG. I know Halliburton is going to change over a lot of their equipment to CNG. So as you start seeing this trend in, in alternative fuels, it's going to be more available for, for refueling. And I, I just think that it's great that the city is trying to manage best practices as we move forward with buying our new equipment. And we certainly will continue to look for grant opportunities if those are available. Great. That's all the questions that I had. Does anybody else have any questions on the Public Works budget? Thank you. Thank you. Seeing none. Thanks, Maria. All right. Last but definitely not least, Police Department. <laughs> You're bringing help to the podium. Good call. <laughs> Turn your microphone on. There you go. I, I will not have to phone a friend this evening. I brought him with me. Ask the audience, right? <laughs> Another lifeline, Chief, just so you know. Exactly. Uh, yes, it, uh, Commander Chuck Baker is here with me this evening in his role uh, as the administrative support commander for our department. Chuck is responsible for coordinating uh, the police department's budget on my behalf and so he uh, has a great deal of knowledge about our budget and has been incredibly helpful in putting together this presentation this evening for you. I'm here this evening to share with you that our community is safer tonight as a result of the efforts underway in our police department. And I want to share a couple of uh, key initiatives with you. Am I going the wrong way? There we go. Uh, a key uh, performance measurements that indicate that. Some of these um, percentages I'm going to share with you are a bit dramatic. There's a bit of a small number phenomenon associated with them, so I'll also in some cases give you the actual numbers. Um, but when comparing the first six months of 2013 with the first six months of 2015, personnel investigations in the department are down 450% gone from 11 in 2013 to 2 in 2015. Citizen complaints are down 53%. Use of force incidents in the community are down 244%. 55 in 2013 to 16 year to date in 16. Pursuits are down from 14 to 3. When comparing our activity levels in the community from the first six months of this year, to the first six months of last year. Calls for service are up 21%. Nibers crimes are down 1.8%. And officer initiated activity in the community is up 28%. And I would share with you our calls for service are up largely as a result of our community engagement efforts. 
and we go out and build relationships with citizens, they're much more likely to call the police. And I can say that because our crime has gone down at the same time our calls have gone up. With all of this increase in activity, we're still achieving our goal of responding to priority one calls for service in the community in seven minutes or less. A tremendous amount of effort uh, that's taken place by the employees in our department. And our budget proposal tonight is reflective of continuing those efforts uh, uh, of change in the organization and some additional improvements that I'm recommending to you along the way. Uh, the largest increase uh, that you see across our department summary is a result of salary and benefits. Uh, the majority of that increase is a result of contractual increases. Uh, so those contracts were signed by all parties earlier in the year. Um, and as a reminder, the city requires, uh, that contract requires the city, rather, to pay police officers 1% above the average salary survey cities uh, of Arvada, Aurora, Boulder, Broomfield, Brighton, Thornton, North Glen, and Westminster. As a result, our uh, wages are competitive in the marketplace. In fact, our officers are better paid than law enforcement officials uh, in our surrounding communities and the average household income of residents of this community. Approved increases also in this area include some court uh, services, court-appointed attorneys and interpreter fees, and I'll explain that uh, later in the presentation but they're also included in that salary section. Uh, contract services uh, for licensing compliance for medical and uh, retail marijuana businesses, there is uh, $42,000 within that salary survey or salary category uh, for us to contract services for our outside additional resources to assist us in conducting the background investigations associated with the ordinance the council adopted. Uh, earlier during this past year. <coughs> Under materials and supplies, we have increases related to ammunition training. Uh, our ammunition has gone up 12% in cost from last year to this year, and that uh, cost continues to escalate uh, over a period of time. Uh, services and charges increase related to third-party contracts, uh, ADCOM, et cetera. I'll talk more about those in our divisional summary. And uh, as Maria mentioned earlier, the Public Works budget is reflective of the vehicle and equipment replacement needed by the department, uh, and we're doing a good job collaborating with them to ensure uh, that the equipment our officers have are the right tools for them uh, to complete their jobs. This is a di divisional summary slide. Uh, the department operates through five divisions, administration, support services, patrol, uh, community justice and um, the Office of Emergency Management, and that's what each of those columns rep represent. I won't walk you through all the specific details, but I would like to talk to you about a few uh, particular areas um, to draw your attention to in, in this uh, part of the presentation. Salary and benefits, operating expenses for our victim advocate program, which we merged uh, with the city of Brighton through an IGA last year, are included. Uh, in the salary section of our budget, um, and there is an increase in cost of about $26,000 from last year to this year. That's a result of having five paid full-time professional positions uh, and some additional training that we're providing to those folks uh, in this new arrangement we have. This really has been a force multiplier for the community. Uh, we have volunteer base. Uh, from both communities to draw from in this area, and we have increased uh, the paid full-time professional staff that are responding out to incidents as they're occurring in our community and providing direct services to victims. Um, our ADCOM communication center um, in costs are increasing uh, as we begin to look at uh, ways to improve the service delivery from ADCOM. Uh, their uh, increases are related to uh, some staffing and personnel additions that are occurring at ADCOM. Those are really things that are beyond our individual control as a community. That represents about $31,000 of increase. Uh, our contribution to the North Metro Drug Task Force has gone up. Um, you'll see an additional $35,000 in this uh, division and request for the Flat Rock Recruit Training Academy. And that is because we plan to put five police recruits in the Flat Rock Police Academy. 
uh, through a non-certified recruitment process that is taking place right now. Uh, we'll get those people selected and uh, onboarded for the January 2016 Academy. And uh, this is really an important part of our efforts to continue to recruit uh, members of this community um, and members that are more reflective of our community to add to our department. Some key initiatives that we have undertaken in the police department really fall under two key areas. Uh, the first of which is our strategic policing model, um, which focuses on increasing service delivery to our residents through a program we call Geographic Command. And the focus is really within the patrol division. The idea is that we are personalizing our service. So command officers and crime prevention officers are specifically signed to three geographic areas in the community. Uh, the idea for them to contact residents and facilitate problem solving within those areas. Uh, so far this year, we've seen a significant increase in that community engagement. Uh, we've held 28 community meetings so far this year, five post-incident neighborhood debriefs, 16 national night out neighborhood events, and another five community meetings with the chief. Uh, this represents considerable effort on all of our staff uh, to mobilize resources and get out in the community and talk about crime prevention, um, and, and share that personalized service. In terms of traffic safety, we have really engaged uh, better this year with Public Works in terms of a more robust approach uh, to improving traffic safety in the community. Um, we've increased education and enforcement. In fact, in July uh, of 2015, uh, we wrote 999 traffic summonses. That's the highest number of the whole year. The summonses are not as important as what's behind them. And what's behind them is we are deploying officers in high traffic accident locations, and we are asking them to write violations that are directly contributing to those accidents. That is all based upon the data um, that we receive, and the officers receive updates on that on a weekly basis now um, in their briefings. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, the first six months of 2014 compared to 2015, we have seen an increase of 16% in our traffic crashes. And as the council will recall, that's been a reoccurring theme uh, over the past many years in the community as we've experienced an increase both in traffic volume and we recognize that there are many arterials that cross our community that are major transportation corridors in the Denver metropolitan area. It is our sincere hope in working with Public Works and through the 2K projects that re-engineering some of those new roadways, expanding the capacity for those roadways, will help improve uh, the safety of those corridors. We had a, a terrible accident uh, just this afternoon on Tower Road involving a semi and six passenger cars. Um, that, that roadway improvement, we certainly hope, will, will increase uh, traffic safety on those arterials. Um, we have uh, improved our regional cooperation again this year, re-engaging with the sex assault response team, which is a multi-jurisdictional and multidisciplinary uh, team that reviews sex assault cases from across the county. Um, and we began a transition with our SRO unit. And we have asked them to really focus on becoming a youth services unit in this community. And that those services are only, not only provided when school is in session, but they are a year-round set of services that we provide to the youth in this community. Now, I want to give you a couple of examples of what we did with our SROs this summer as opposed to redeploying them in the patrol division uh, as district officers. We started a safety net program where we asked these officers to adopt 7 to 10 youth from their schools for ongoing mentoring throughout the course of the summer. The officers checked in with these kids and their families with the idea of providing them positive role model mentoring and particularly to keep them out of at-risk behaviors during the summer months. The SROs handled all of our running, runaway and missing person follow-ups. Uh, they often know who these kids are and where they would go if they run away. It was a great use of our resources. Um, they handled all youth-related calls for service in the districts when they were available. They spent a great deal of time at the outdoor 
pool, once it opened again, they know a lot of the people that are there. While we didn't assign them specifically there, they were oftentimes on bicycles and able to swing by uh, that pool and provide um, some services there. Our programs with parks and recreation continue to grow, and, and that partnership uh, continues to deliver some meaningful experiences for youth in our community over the summer. We held five Bike with a Cop events in June. Um, we had police camp, and this year um, we added a four-day mini camp for younger uh, kids in our community that was a tremendous success and was featured uh, on several media stories across the metropolitan area. Uh, we've established self-initiated activity and performance standards across all divisions, um, and uh, people are really responding to those, as you see, in the increase in activity, and uh, those things are certainly making our communities safer. Uh, the second area was to become a learning organization. This was our second key focus area in the organization. And uh, one of the, the key efforts that is underway in the department is the uh, is the uh, audit of the last three years of our sex assault investigations. And this was really uh, started as a result of a review of the statistical data that indicated uh, in comparison to other Adams County agencies, we had a lower clearance rate on adult sex assault cases than our peer communities. And so we began to want to investigate why that might be and if there were opportunities for improvement in those areas. Um, to ensure we're achieving our goal of conducting vigorous criminal investigations, protecting the public, and seeking justice for all victims. Um, we initiated this audit. Um, it is comprised of um, detectives from five different police departments, two different district attorney's offices, victim services, uh, subject matter experts from four private organizations are involved um, in this audit. Uh, we have completed 90 cases in, in the review, and we have about another 90 cases to go. And uh, we've already identified some uh, early trends um, that are going to help us in the future in how we provide these services um, to, the, to the community. At the conclusion of this audit, we certainly hope to be able to publish these results. We only know of one other police department in the country who has taken on uh, this kind of work, and, and I really believe we're leading the charge in terms of looking at our own ways of conducting this business. Uh, when you talk about innovation, uh, I believe this is certainly one of those areas um, where we've taken the risk to say, let's, let's do this and see what we can learn um, about how we conduct these operations in our community. We certainly want to identify areas for improvement, evaluate and modify our response to these kinds of investigations, provide training, uh, highlight our strengths, and better serve crime victims in our community. Uh, because the City Council authorized an additional position in the department in 2014 uh, to manage the registered sex offenders in our community, uh, we have made some significant changes. Um, that detective is now responsible for interviewing all registered sex offenders during the registration process. He also uh, goes out regularly and conducts home visits and inspections and ensures compliance with the regulations uh, that are required by the court or imposed by the court for, for the, that individual offender. Today we have 146 registered sex offenders in our community, and so far 16 people have been granted exceptions to the ordinance that this council adopted last year through the administrative hearing process. Uh, so this is a, a, a huge success and working very well, and we've sent a very clear message to those registering in our community to reside here. We are on top of this. Uh, we are managing this population, and we care deeply about the safety of our residents. And, and so uh, this has been a great program for us in that respect. We've implemented the department's first automated early warning system to track officer conduct and enable supervisors the opportunity to intercede with coaching and mentoring uh, when conduct is, or misconduct rather, is, is occurring at a lower level. Uh, this is all done in an effort to... Um, uh, tra train the officers uh, differently and to have them meet our performance expectations. Uh, with the support of Professional Standards Division, a team of officers and sergeants are reviewing and rewriting our department's policy on the use of force. That's a small part of the overall use of force inspection that we're doing, which also include evaluating the model that we train on 
how we provide that training and if that model needs to be altered in any way uh, in the future. We've increased training this year throughout the department. Every officer will have received 80 hours of in-service training uh, in 2015. We did 40 hours for every officer uh, earlier this spring, and in November we'll do an additional 40 hours of training, and that's in addition uh, to the training we send folks to outside the organization. Uh, during the first, two, the first six months of 2015, we expended 86% of our allocated training budget dollars, um, again, just showing our commitment and, and our dedication to ensuring that our employees are getting the training that they need uh, to be able to operate effectively in, in the community. And we continue to work on uh, rewriting and developing our policy manual. We've already covered uh, several of these line item variances, uh, but I want to highlight a couple for you. Uh, prisoner transports uh, are one of those. We made the decision to begin using G4S to transport our prisoners to the Adams County Jail um, beyond just the court detentions. So when we have multiple offenders that are in our uh, facility, the sergeants have the ability to call G4S and have them come with a transport van. Uh, that decision keeps our police officers doing important work in our community and allows others to help us with the transportation services. G4S has recently changed the policy that they have requiring multiple detention specialists in that vehicle when they're transporting more than one prisoner. Uh, that's a reasonable policy change. It is reflective of what I would require when police officers were transporting multiple offenders, and I think that increase uh, is very reasonable in that area. Uh, the other one is our emergency management outside services account. You'll see that last line there has a, a, a funny uh, indicator in the last uh, line. I think that's supposed to be a 100% increase. In reality, that's been a light item in this budget uh, over the period of years. Uh, the line item and its detail was in the 2014 budget, but the money was not allocated in that account and so this is restoring that funding in 2016 and we are doing all of the things under that account in 15 and just covering those expenses with some salary savings that we have in the department. Um, these uh, items that we have requested uh, are to help uh, the officers meet these uh, expectations with respect uh, both to IT and the special considerations. Uh, we identified during the course of this year that some of the equipment, uh, training, and the policy related to personal protective equipment, which is what PPE stands for, are not in compliance with OSHA guidelines um, and are deficient in some ways. And we began to address that by doing an inventory, rewriting our policy, and this request will allow us to complete uh, reissuing personal protective equipment to all of our field personnel, not just foreign officers, but our CSOs and others who are out doing field work. We'll all receive this equipment, training about how to use the equipment. Uh, these are things like blood-borne path pathogens and other hazards that uh, they may come across uh, during the course of the performance of their duties. Uh, the officer recruitment I've already covered. That's the Flat Rock um, Academy training for January. Um, the inventory maintenance system, um, this, this is not a property in evidence. Um, this is a SIS software system that will allow us to track our assets. So uh, officers use a wide variety of equipment during the course of the performance of their duties. They check out lasers and radars and uh, various pieces of equipment. Uh, today we really have no ability to manage that equipment, to know where it's located, or to plan for uh, replacement and maintenance of that equipment. All of that would be capable uh, under this inventory uh, and management system, and it really is reflective of being a learning organization. Uh, the digital evidence management system um, is here as a request to address um, our ongoing efforts to continue our improvements in how we manage property and evidence uh, for the department. And uh, this system will allow us to appropriately store and maintain the chain of custody of our digital evidence that we seize. Uh, photographs, uh, things from smartphones, uh, tape recordings, 
uh, et cetera, videotape, all would be loaded into uh, this software system and allow us to store it um, in a much more secure uh, way and maintain the integrity of that evidence. Uh, the Lumen system is a computer software system that allows for uh, internal queries of our data. It essentially takes all of our data and provides uh, the ability to Google, if you will, our crime data and, and really quickly identify trends and themes. Uh, the idea being that we, we simply and easily put in the hands of our employees actionable intelligence information. And, and this system uh, purports uh, to do that quite well. We're just getting ready to install and start the system under a free trial system, and this would allow us to continue the use of that software into 2016. The final one up there is a scheduling and tracking system. The department currently utilizes two different systems to track its uh, timekeeping and scheduling. Uh, we have 130 or approximately there about employees in the organization and scheduling uh, them on a 24-hour a day, seven-day-a-week basis is, is quite a task. And at times we need additional resources. And, and this computer system in an automated way um, allows us to pre-plan when we have staffing shortages. It would notify supervisors, hey, you've got a problem two weeks down the road. And in fact, when the supervisor approves uh, for the system to do it, it in an automated way will begin to telephone uh, our personnel and sign them up to work those shifts. This system also would combine our off-duty work that we do um, at the stadium and largely. It does occur in some other areas, but largely that work is there. Um, our current system for, for tracking um, our off-duty work was, uh, the department was a beta site for a software system that was developed many years ago. It is way beyond its usable life and we cannot get any upgrades to that system. This would combine all of those things in an automated way and really enhance our ability um, to schedule uh, activities and resources to meet those demands in the future. And it would be very much in line with our efforts uh, with area command as well. As I mentioned, there are a few items in here from municipal court. That is because the community justice division, which is where revenue is housed from the court surcharge, is actually a division within the police department's budget. So those first two items there really don't have anything to do with the police department, but they come from that revenue source, so they're within our budget. Um, there has been an increase in need in municipal court for both court-appointed attorneys and court-appointed interpreters, and so those increases are reflective of uh, providing that level of service in municipal court in 2016. Uh, the last two items are, are really related to focusing on developing less lethal force options in uh, our uh, tools in our officers' um, uh, command and giving them the ability to hopefully de-escalate incidents and use less degrees of force to resolve things. Um, this training, these training supplies will allow us to do training in different ways as I've spoken with you about the need to integrate our skills training moving forward in the future. That requires some additional supplies um, to, to begin to do that. Finally, we have some additional requests um, that we are making um, we spoke, we have spoken before about body cameras and I want to share with you that the police body cameras have increased in utilization across our nation in response to the changing landscape regarding the police and uses of force incidents that have been highlighted across our country. The United States Department of Justice has recommended the implementation of this technology in its review of several police departments in and it's contained in recommendations from the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing, which we'll discuss more uh, in just a moment. As of July 7th, there were 47 agencies in the state of Colorado using body cameras. Uh, this growing group of agencies that are using them has created experience with this technology and, and really has developed a series of recommendations and best practices for us. Um, those lessons learned will help govern our implementation of these cameras. Uh, that coupled with the largely positive results achieved across 
uh, different police organizations, including reductions in use of force, um, including reductions in officer overtime for courts, the number of trials have gone down, uh, the amount of time taken to investigate citizen complaints has gone down, citizen complaints in general have gone down. Um, all of those positive benefits have, have been realized in other communities. As you know, I was not a proponent of implementing this system um, in, in times in the past, um, but I do now believe with this additional information that we have learned um, that we are in a position to be able to implement this system and do it quite well and experience um, these benefits. Uh, I share with you um, a, a quote given from uh, Sergeant uh, Dean Cunningham of the Fort Collins Police Department to the Coloradoan. Uh, the department there in Fort Collins had seen a 100% reduction in use of force complaints in the first year uh, and he cited that people generally act calmer when they know their incident is being recorded. And it even had led to a drop in court overtime as the video meant fewer cases went to trial. And, and that's just one community's experience. Um, I, I share with you that uh, earlier today I had a, my normally scheduled quarterly meeting uh, with the executive board of the Fraternal Order of Police. I was able to share with them both this request and the next one I'm going to talk about. Uh, during my discussions with them, um, they did not uh, share with me any concerns about the implementation of body cameras. They told me, in fact, that they had suspected we would be moving in that direction in the future, and they thought that it may be helpful in reducing officer complaints and, and uh, justifying the actions that they've taken uh, through the use of this video system. So. I'm very encouraged uh, both by that meeting today and the feedback that I received from them uh, about this report. The article that I just quoted the sergeant from Fort Collins on is, is attached in this link to this map. And uh, if you open that article up, you'll be able to increase this map and identify exactly which 47 departments in the state are implementing body cameras. Uh, or have, I uh, should say, have already implemented body cameras in the state of Colorado. Uh, finally, uh, the Citizens Advisory Committee um, uh, is a, a piece of work that was in my work plan uh, for the future, and uh, this budget request is reflective of accelerating uh, the deployment of the creation of a Citizens Advisory Committee, and, and that really comes uh, from the perspective that the 21st century uh, policing report uh, was completed in June of this year. And, and in my analysis of that report, I believe it to be a substantial document. Uh, and I believe it to have some really good recommendations um, that I would like to have some help and some input from the community uh, in evaluating those recommendations and, and seeking whether or not those things are uh, relevant and, and timely for implementation in the department. Uh, this suggestion uh, for you in this budget consideration is that that uh, citizens board would serve in an advisory role um, and, and it would be focused on meeting the department and the city council's goals with respect to improving citizen safety in our community. Uh, my suggestion is if you support this recommendation uh, during our budget uh, retreat that we would spend more time with the council to uh, refine the mission and focus uh, to look for uh, specific appointments and tasks before implementing uh, this through those discussions. The uh, bull bullets that are up there uh, in the circles are the six pillars that were identified through that report and there are several recommendations, pages of them, for each of those pillars. Um, again, I find this to be a very thoughtful document and one that I believe uh, deserves considerable focus and attention um, from this department. Uh, in conclusion, I would like to share with you that uh, call, while I said calls for service are up, uh, so is officer-initiated activity. This is reflective of our community engagement strategy and is resulting in stronger relationships between the police department and the community. These data points clearly demonstrate that our community is safer because of the reform efforts being implemented and the contributions of our employees who are both dedicated and committed uh, to the safety of the citizens in this community. 
The budget ref request put forth uh, reflects the continuation of our pursuit of excellence and the addition of several key components to enhance and accelerate our progress to make the community safer and our police department more effective. I am honored to serve this community uh, as the chief of police and I'm humbled by the support that I've received from the city council and the city manager and the leadership team as a whole. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thanks, Chief. Quite a presentation. Um, <clears throat> first off, uh, I think the stuff that you're planning on implementing is great. Um, I do have a question because I know <clears throat> it's been a concern of this council and a concern of the community. Officers, how many we were down, and can you uh, let us know where we're at today? I can. Um, as of <coughs> right now, today, uh, we have five sworn police vacancies in our authorized strength. Um, and we have the non-certified recruitment uh, that is currently ongoing. Um, that includes uh, four officers that will be starting our next in-house academy, which is slated to start September 21st of this month or next month. Um, so I think five is the lowest number of vacancies in sworn positions since I have been the chief here, um, and it is really reflective of uh, some incredible work by our folks in professional standards who have really done a fantastic job of working uh, to fill uh, our vacancies. Thank you. You know, first and foremost, public safety is uh, number one um, issue for us. We want to make sure that we have a safe community. Uh, I know you have the officers to do that, um, and hopefully we'll see those five positions fill up. You know, it helps with morale, it helps with everything, and hopefully uh, all the things that you've, you've pointed out, the reduction in um, different crimes, the reduction in uh, use of force, all those things are, are very important and we're glad to see the progression um, take place. I'm hoping that, and I was, I was one of the ones that was really worried about what happens with the body cameras. Are the FOP guys not going to like this? You know, how does this resolve um, some of our uh, concerns with morale? And uh, I'm really glad that you had that meeting with them today and that they were able to say, hey, you know what, we anticipated it coming. And I want it to be beneficial to the employees um, to help protect them as well. I think that, that's, that's a huge piece to me is the protection of those employees as well. Um, I didn't see any problem with the budget. I, I hope that you asked for all of the, the things that you needed for your department to make sure that this community is safe. And uh, with that, I'll... Pass it on to other members of the council. Yes. Councilwoman Carson. Chief, thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm very happy, I will tell you, to see the addition of these uh, body cameras and of, I don't know what I did here, of the um, Citizens Advisory Committee. Uh, I know Mr. McEldowney and I have had conversations over the years that we've been seated here. Um, for some of these additions. I, I think it's wonderful. I, I do want to thank you um, for taking us into the 21st century policing. All jobs change, life changes, and thank you for seeing that. Uh, I, I know change is hard, and I, I'm sure that we have some people who aren't real happy with the change. But as our job setting up here, as the mayor said, uh, one of our number one responsibilities is to make sure the public is safe. I, I feel very good about this. Um, I was able to read parts of the uh, 21st century policing that was put out by the, there's a lot of words here, the President's Task Force, Task Force Committee. Yeah. Uh, you're right on track. And I do think it's probably been a lot of work on your part it's also probably a lot of work on our officers' parts to make these changes. I commend you and I commend all of them and thank everybody for being able to make these changes. All these great programs that you have brought for community engagement. Um, I, I can't thank you and the officers enough for those changes. Um, some of the programs you have brought to the youth in this, this city, uh, that's priceless. 
Uh, so all I can say is thank you very much. I hope this council supports the additions to these budgets. Uh, I think they are something that we really need to, to go forward with. So uh, that's about all I have to say, but thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. McElvowney. Thank you, Chief. I'll, uh, I'll try and be brief. Uh, I'll echo uh, everything that uh, Councilwoman Carson said, and, and thank you for an incredibly thorough presentation. I think uh, it, it's, it's great to hear your enthusiasm for what is not an easy undertaking um, relative to, to change and um, helping lead us forward. Um, it, it, is, it is incredibly heartening to hear the statistics and the, the positive trends. Um, one of the first things I remember talking to you about when you came on was data, and it's, it's neat to see how that data and the use of that as a tool gets applied. Um, you know, it's something as simple as where are we having traffic accidents and talking about that on a weekly basis and trying to drill into those locations and stem that problem it seems like a no-brainer, but without the tools and the sort of culture to make that happen, it doesn't happen. And so um, it does take lots of little things that over time you get that sort of sum of all parts. So thank you. Um, I'm incredibly excited about, uh, about the momentum and um, I, I, speaking on behalf of my of the community, right? I, I think we are all thankful for the service of, of your very talented team. So thank you. Thank you very much. All right, Mr. Douglas. <clears throat> yes, thank you, Chief, for the presentation. Um, everything, I mean, J.D. and Jason touched on a lot of things I wanted to say. Uh, I, I do like the analytics uh, that you're introduced as far as fighting crime and all that and be ahead of the curve with all that information. That's great, especially for um, future. So that's that's data that's already entered. You don't have to worry about re-entering again. And uh, that's very helpful when you're out there trying to track um, criminals in our, in our city. Um, with the, this additional five officers, I know they're in training and, and you know, some fall through the cracks. Not everybody makes it through the training. But just say that all five went through. Would this help out with the hours about reinstating the 40 hour week program and getting these officers off these long hours? Yeah, so um, let me answer the question uh, as I understand it in two ways and see if I, if I get it what you're asking. Um, first of all, we have five vacancies. Uh, that doesn't include the people that we have in training. Yep. Uh, we have a number of people that are in training uh, that aren't actually performing in the field. And once they complete training and are deployed, uh, we're going to be in a, a much better position than we've been. Um, in an effort to accomplish some of the very significant changes that I have uh, talked with you all about making with respect to how we conduct our training, the only way uh, for me to be able to accomplish those undertakings and achieve the outcomes that I've laid out for you is for us to return to the 410 platoon schedule that will allow uh, for that regular training day once a month. It's better for everyone. It's better for our ability to be able to have training repetitions monthly than to only have them twice a year. Um, it's better in terms of providing additional training opportunities to the members of the organization. So uh, I shared with the FOP today and I share with you, I am still very much committed uh, to returning to that schedule just as soon as we can uh, in an effort to achieve these training outcomes and priorities that I've established for the department. There simply is no way to achieve them on our current schedule, uh, on the 12-hour schedule. Uh, a date certain when we could do that, uh, factors beyond my control. And um, it's looking like now that's probably sometime in the spring uh, if these people are to complete their training uh, that we would be looking towards uh, getting that uh, change made to the 10-hour schedule. But again, those are factors that I don't have uh, the ability to control. The, the factors that we do have the ability to control, like our recruitment efforts, have been refined uh, in ways that I think have substantially contributed uh, to us bringing new members to the organization. And I'm confident at some point uh, we are going to reach uh, that point where we are at our authorized strength. Yeah, <clears throat> I appreciate that because some of our, our best assets are those officers, men and women out there, because 
every day, you know, they come in contact with our citizens and to have a, a very positive outcome uh, after their uh, encounter with people in our community um, is is great. That's, you know, that's what you want. You, you want people to uh, reflect um, how well these guys are, 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 men and women are trained, and that reflects on us as, as uh, sitting here on city council as well. So I appreciate that. Absolutely. I concur. The uh, results I report to you tonight are a result of not the work that I'm doing, but the work of our command staff and of the officers who are out in the field. They're doing tremendous work. Thank you very much. All right, Mr. Tater. Thanks, Chief, for the presentation. Um, I don't see anything in here on a subject that we used to have a lot of conversation on, so I'm going to ask you your opinion. Um, the other day, I was, someone was trying to convince me that we had a gang problem in Commerce City, and if we do, I have not seen it myself lately, so I would like to hear your opinion on uh, the gang problems we might have in Commerce City, if we have any. Um, gangs have, have changed over the years. Their complexity has changed in how they operate. They no longer are nearly as prolific as they were in the 1990s about, one, claiming their membership or affiliation to a gang, and two, flying colors um, that allowed for easy identification of gang members. That has all changed. Uh, that draw drew the ire and, and attention of law enforcement and made it fairly easy for us to make those contacts. And, and they certainly have gotten more sophisticated uh, in how they handle uh, their membership and their organization, if you will. Um, so, so detecting uh, gang activity is more difficult than it used to be. Um, we have been concerned and have, in fact, investigated in, in some of the incidents of shootings that we've had in the community, whether there were, in fact, uh, ties that we were able to substantiate uh, to gang involvement. And I'm not aware that any of our uh, incidents we were able to do that. Uh, that does not mean that we don't have gang activity in our community, and it doesn't mean uh, that gang members don't travel uh, to, through, and, and from our community on a day-to-day -day basis. But um, uh, being able to substantiate that involvement and make that claim are, are two different things. Um, it is something that we are concerned about. Um, we see gang activity escalating in our bordering community to the south, and we are concerned about that activity being pushed uh, into our community. It's something that we have had many discussions about. Um, within the command staff and, and our crime prevention officers, and they spend a great deal of time uh, when they are in uh, neighborhoods or in apartment complexes where those kinds of things might be occurring, trying to identify intelligence information that would help us um, uh, pick up on those trends. Um, so it's not a great answer to your question, but it is the answer uh, that I have. Well, um, thank you for your, your information there. I know things times have changed and you don't see the blues and the reds anymore and yeah so thanks for the update yes all right mr bullock i want to thank you chief uh, for your presentation um i would just be redundant in saying everything that everyone has said so i would just say thank you for your presentation and uh i'm happy for what you're doing with it and i'm very happy for the recommendations you brought forth thank you very much mr amador Thank you, Chief, for your presentation. Again, I do want to echo what majority of the council has said. Um, but looking at the presentation and the data that you have uh, in front of us in the presentation speaks volumes to the work that you're putting in and obviously the hours that uh, the command staff are putting in to try to better our community. I know this is, again, a budget meeting, and so I'm looking at the overall bottom line of only 6.2%, and all of the uh, items that you have put in front of us, 6.2% is nominal, in my opinion, when you start to look at the safety and the implementation of gathering data and policies, and, and there, there's just a gamut of things here uh, for us to look at. So um, I'm glad that you feel comfortable asking for the resources that you need in a limited basis of 6.2%. I mean, I just keep looking at this going, wow. So uh, good job. Keep doing what you're doing. And um, 
we'll look forward to hearing more of the information that you're putting out. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Elliott. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Chief, for the presentation. Um, it's just, I have to say, it's really refreshing to hear of all these changes that are being implemented within your department. Um, I really appreciate the definitive information explaining and educating us as far as the uh, systems that are in place uh, and the programs that the uh, department is involved in. Um, I also want to just give you kudos because it was it was very helpful with the information that you provided last week at the study session for the uh, the body cameras. Uh, you know, when you when you just hear of of an, a request, but there's not enough information to really make a, a sound decision, uh, it, it makes it difficult. But you know, with all the information, I've done some some homework and I've looked at the uh, the link that you provided with uh, with last week's information and again with with this week. Uh, and I feel pretty comfortable with that. And I, I can definitely see something uh, that that direction where the city will, will definitely turn to. Um, so again, just it's, it's a tremendous amount of effort. Uh, I'm very appreciative of that. Uh, and moving forward, we can only hope for the best. And I just want to give kudos to your department for keeping our city safe. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Mm -hmm. right. Seeing no one else, Chief, great presentation. Um, look forward to the force being at full strength and reducing those hours. Um, you're doing a good job. Appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. <clears throat> all right. Now we get past all the uh, presentations, and we'll move into administrative council business. Does anyone on council have any administrative council business they would like to bring up this evening? All right. Mr. Bullock. Yes, I have a couple of items I'd like to bring up in administrative council business. Uh, one of them, I know that we're going to uh, celebrate our employees this week on Wednesday. And it's come to my attention that we have a lot of long-term part-time employees that receive no recognition, even after being here five, ten years, working in a part-time capacity. I would like to see some kind of recognition for our long-term part-time employees it may not be the plaque or the things that the full-time employees get, but a letter of recognition or something to show that we are truly appreciative of these employees that work part-time for us over this period of years. You know, and um, I just, I know they're out there, and I know sometimes they feel like they're forgotten when they do employee recognitions that they've been here and some of them, if they had wished to go on a full time, would be getting five, ten year pins by now. But um, it's just something I thought it's uh, ideal whose time has come. And another thing I want to bring up, um, Leadership Commerce City is starting uh, this Friday. It's an 11 month, 11 month course and training uh, leaders of Commerce City. And uh, classes will be held uh, the first uh, Friday of every month for the next 11 months, and graduation will be next June. Um, and if any of the council members would like to sign up for Leadership Commerce City, um, there's a website I can give you the information for. If any residents out there are watching this and would think that this would help them, learn more about the city that they live in. Um, just um, there's um, get in touch with me and I'll give you the website. Okay, but um, the first class is this Friday. And that's my thank you. Uh, Councilman Elliott. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, first of all, I just want to I want to give kudos to the staff, city staff that worked so hard for the uh, outreach that we had this past week. I got a lot of positive response from citizens. I've been out in the community for the last few days, um, especially out on the weekend, uh, attending different events. But I've, I uh, think this is probably one of the most well-attended events that we've had as far as the outreaches go. Um, it was a little concerned because now that we have the water park, we don't have that extra space anymore. But Everything actually seemed to fit perfectly, and, and it was uh, well received. So I just wanted to share that first off. A um, couple concerns uh, out in the neighborhood this weekend. I was at the uh, intersection of 64th Avenue and Olive, and I know that we had a very concerned resident 
a uh, few months ago was stating that uh, accidents, there, there, there have been a few accidents that have been uh, traumatizing to her uh, and her husband at the residence. Uh, and so I actually stood there and I was actually uh, talking with some neighbors and I witnessed four vehicles that just ran various stop signs. It was, and actually one of them was a tow truck, which I thought was ironic. It was pulled right in front of another vehicle. It's almost as though they call, cause the accident, they will end up towing the vehicle uh, due to their fault. But uh, it's definitely something that I think warrants another discussion with council. Um, that particular house in, in question that, uh, um, I don't know her last name, I, 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 her, her first name is Shirley, uh, she has several posts. In fact, I even took pictures, and I can obviously send those to you, Mr. City Manager. But there are several cement posts that, that surround her fence as she's on the corner. And uh, one of the neighbors said, you know, she's very concerned, and she's, she's almost panic-stricken any time she hears any type of vehicle activity, whether it's someone squealing their tires or you can hear cars speeding. Uh, it was pretty dangerous for me to be crossing uh, with my son. Uh, it was a Sunday afternoon, uh, well, Sunday mid-morning around 11 o'clock, and the type of traffic that was there was actually pretty pretty concerning to me. So I, I would like to, to bring this to council and to staff that maybe this is something we could also, or I mean, we could all uh, review again, and um, it's, it's definitely worth revisiting. Uh, another concern that was brought up was that whether two cracks that were in the um, in that particular street on 64th Avenue, um, and I have pictures of those. And I understand that goes along with our pavement management program, but they're pretty substantial cracks. And uh, I mean, from curb to curb, massive. Uh, so maybe just kind of give me some update, or I can I can send that. Yes, I can send that information, or send the pictures that I, I took on my phone. Um, and then last, same area, I was there for a while, <laughs> if, you can, if you haven't figured that out. But um, the lighting, and I actually drove back down there. And, you know, I've driven that street but never really thought about it until somebody brought it to my attention. And it is actually a very dark area. Uh, right there, um, again, 64th and Olive uh, I would say on the south side of the street next to or near the um, Goody Centennial Church there, it is pretty dark. There's only one street light that's on the uh, north side of 64th. And although it provides adequate lighting, it's still somewhat of a concern uh, because there's a park next door to that church as well. And I think it would probably help deter any type of activity, uh, if you will in that area. So um, just wanted to bring those items uh, to staff and, and to council if there were any questions or concerns or if we can get some, some other information to kind of follow up with what we've had before in that area. That's it. Thank you. Thanks. Those are some good items. And I know staff will be following up with uh, the concerns brought forward. <clears throat> Mr. Douglas. Uh, yes, I have a, a few here. Um, I met with uh, uh, Brian and Maria here uh, shortly before our council started and had sp spoke to trans, trans fans, bridges. They're trying to relocate here. Well, they're trying to come into Commerce City from Boulder, and they're the ones who make span bridges. Um, I met with a guy over here off of uh, Chambers by the creek um, to see what that would look like. And I pass that on to uh, Maria and, and Brian for them to to uh, to see what we could do for Citizens uh, Bridge as far as bikes and commute. Um, it's really less expensive. And um, I just forward you guys some pictures of some kids that are stacking pallets in the second creek to walk across that creek to get to the to the school and over to the park. And uh, it's not a very wide area, but this company also. Um, builds pedestrian bridges uh, for that purpose. And so um, just let everybody know about that. No, uh, this is only to to inquire to see what that would cost um, and not taking a, a, a lot of uh, time to find out uh, what, the, what the cost is going to be. 
Um, the other thing is, um, I know the last you know four years we've been here uh, on council, we've had um, economic development um, uh, has has turned over uh, a few times there, and and like to see if we could form an economic development committee. Um, meet with two councilors and maybe a third as an alternate, with um, maybe uh, citizens from each ward and two at large. Uh, to focus, this committee will focus on sit down at restaurants and other need based commerce as, as, as far as helping that uh, uh, get that started. Not in saying that this is an ongoing thing, uh, but if council could uh, consider maybe economic development committee, uh, as we did with legislative committee and, and other needs that we find, uh, like uh, airport committee, it was very helpful when it came to, to negotiations. Um, I thought I would, I would ask uh, to see what council uh, thinks about forming a committee like that. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, with the construction of uh, E-470 coming up here, I'm sorry, um, with Tower Road coming up, what would that look like as far as where the traffic is going to be diverted? Because Highway 2 is, is it's far off the beaten path for people who are traveling uh, on that east side. Um, would there be any way that we could work with E-470, uh, maybe a, a letter or so addressing that uh, our citizens that use that way for for uh, traffic could enter on 104th and exit off of Tower Road and then uh, being that they have a, a um, E-470 pass be credited uh, on that amount to their account since we're being, uh, since, since they're being impacted by the construction. And since, you know, uh, Commerce City did help E-470 out um, so many years ago to construct E-470, in return, we, we're going to need some help diverting our traffic when, when, when that uh, tower road is, is widened. That's it. All right. Mr. Benson. Thank you. Um, you know, about five weeks ago, at our council meeting, I think early July, um, I brought up the issue of what are we going to be doing with the dog track property. And um, instead of setting something up at that time in a study session or in a regular meeting to talk about it, we were told that there was going to be a presentation tonight by Regen or Rick Wells. And then now I'm told that, well, that's been put off until September 21st. I don't know what's going to happen on September 21st. I expect that somebody's going to ask for a further extension of time. You know, we bought this property five years ago. I believe it was five years ago in uh, 2010. It was one of the debacles that Paul Natal and Jerry Flannery got us into, and I'm ashamed to say that I voted for it. It was a unanimous vote. I'm ashamed that that was one of the things that I voted for while I was on this council. And then... A year or two later, that was $3 million, $3.5 million. A year or two later, we spent another $2.5 million on the demolition of it. Now, that was an 8-to-1 vote. I voted against that. And so 18 months ago, we gave uh, recognition to Regen and Rick Wells saying, you, you have the authority to go ahead and try to develop this property or help us with the development. And, of course, several of us uh, 10 months ago went to Chicago and looked at some uh, developments by this company called the Michaels Company. A couple of months ago, we were told that that was no longer on the table. That had fallen through. And now, here we are. We still don't have any uh, firm idea about what we're going to do with this six million dollars that we've got tied up in this property. I, I talked to Roger at the outreach Thursday night. He advised that for the Tower Road uh, utility infrastructure, that's two and a half million dollars. Where are we going to come up with that money? Take it out of uh, some other department's uh, budget that we've seen here tonight? Might even be a, what was the million and a half for, Roger? You said it was two and a half plus a million and a half. What were those two things? There is, uh, there's the water utilities and then the drainage issue. 
Okay, so it's about four million. Right. We're going to need four million dollars. Where is that money going to come from? Are we going to increase sales tax some more? We got six million dollars tied up in this project, and it's not going anywhere. And I'm just. Uh, we need money for that. We need money for Section 8 housing. We got 130,000 to help the police department get these body cameras, which I think is a great idea. Um, I'm told that we don't have enough people in neighborhood services to enforce the ordinances that we already have on the books that would result in the elimination of a lot of slum properties. And I'm told that uh, the development of a uh, sit-down restaurant up north is way down here on our priorities. We don't have enough people in economic development to do that. Maybe if we had this six million dollars or some part of it back in our general fund, we might be able to fund these these things. But especially the Tower Road infrastructure for four million dollars. Where is that money going to come from? And I'm just, I'm going to ask the council to approve Let's get an appraisal done on that property and find out what our alternatives are, whether it's worth anything right now. Is it worth $6 million? Is it worth $4 million, $3 million? It just sort of helps us understand what our alternatives could be in case this whole deal with Rick Wells and Regen falls apart. We wound up giving this project to the last man standing. Two people responded. One of them dropped out before we had the vote. We gave it to the last man standing. And here we are. Is it 18 months? Brian, is that right? Was that 18 months ago that we did that? What? I don't recall the exact date, but I think that's a pretty good estimate. That's pretty good, pretty close. So in 18 months, nothing has happened. Um, I know we spend hours arguing about things that involve a couple of thousand dollars. This is six million dollars that we've got tied up. What are we going to do about it? Anyway, I would move that we authorize the staff to engage an appraiser, to give us an appraiser on that property. I'm sure it's going to be another eight to one vote, but I've got to get it on the record that I think we ought to do this. Probably won't even be a second, but we'll see. I have a motion. Is there a second to do an appraisal on the dog track property? Seeing none, the motion fails. All right, I'm going to have Brian uh, uh, and his staff do their best to help um, answer some of Mr. Vincent's questions about, and, and the biggies are, Infrastructure for Tower Road, which we know we have to put in um, just for the record. I did go to the Water District board meeting um, last Wednesday, asked the Water District to participate financially 50% of the installation and of, of the water and sewer infrastructure for Tower Road. That road is a very expensive project. We know it all needs to be done. It's a 2K project, so it's funded. However, based on our legal advice, the uh, utilities weren't a part of that ballot measure. Therefore, we need to make sure we put the utilities in. This council has decided to put those utilities in when we do the road work so that we don't have a $53 million road being chopped up later in time to put in the water and sewer infrastructure. It just doesn't make sense to spend three times as much on the infrastructure to, to do it later than to do it up front. I did go to the board meeting, talked to the uh, manager and the members of the water board, asked them to participate at 50% of the cost. Uh, I believe it's about $2.1 million for the water and sewer infrastructure. 2.1, 2.6, somewhere in that range. One and a half, so even better. Um, the Water District did respond. Um, they said that they, they didn't want to participate for a couple of reasons. One, um, they didn't want to pull money from other projects. And two, um, that they have a policy against doing uh, infrastructure for benefit of the developers. Now, 
<clears throat> we know we have to have this road built. We know that um, commercial economic development, um, industrial economic development is going to follow suit when the road's built and the infrastructure's in place, the water sewer lines are there. Um, it, it's unfortunate we didn't get the partnership from, the, from, from South Adams because ultimately those lines will belong to them. Um, that, will be, that will be their infrastructure. Um, however, I, I can say I did go make the ask. I would like staff to respond to some of the things that Mr. Benson put out. Where are we with, with Regen? Where are we with the money for the infrastructure on Tower Road? Where's this coming from? And uh, again, I hear economic development restaurants aren't a priority. Can staff just try to answer that without going into a long, drawn out scenario? Not very well. Uh, those are a lot of big questions. Um, to take them in order, uh, funding for Tower Road infrastructure the additional utility work that City Council authorized. We'll be laying out a funding uh, strategy for that at the budget retreat next Monday. Some more information uh, for that will be coming next Monday, but it will have a ripple effect. Uh, we don't have $4 million uh, sitting around, so it is being pulled from other projects. So to Mr. Benson's point, uh, it does have an impact. So we'll, we'll share that funding strategy uh, next Monday. Uh, the next uh, time we plan to discuss the dog track and the developer Rick Wells with the URA Board of Directors is September 21st. Because the information is the subject of negotiations related to the master developer agreement, I think it's probably best to update the URA Board of Directors in an executive session. Uh, but the plan is to have Mr. Wells here that night so that you will have the opportunity to ask him questions directly when you're sitting as the URA uh, Board of Directors. Economic development, uh, at City Council's request, we are planning a broader overview and update of the city's economic development efforts on September 14th. Michelle Claymore and her team are working at pulling some information together to discuss priorities, staffing, uh, other resources uh, on September 14th. So it doesn't answer those questions, but uh, some information as to when we'll be able to answer those questions in the appropriate amount of detail. All right, thank you. All right, let's go to the next person. Um, Mr. Bullock, did you have comments? No. Administrative Council business? No. All right. I have one item that I'd like to bring up, um, hopefully, and, and Lisa's out of town, otherwise, I would have had a paper copy for you in front of all of you. I did mention to you. Oh, you got it? All right. I did mention to you the, uh, um, the leadership exchange has, has uh, offered me and, and asked me to participate with Mayor Hancock in Chicago at a, a leadership event um, to speak. Um, you all received the request for travel. Um, just so you all know, I have no desire to uh, go this year to NLC. Um, it, it will conflict with uh, my son in the Air Force is coming home for a visit, and um, I'm not going to be traveling to Nashville. So this is, uh, as far as I can see, the only travel request I'll have for the rest of the year. Um, but I, I do think it will be beneficial to Commerce City, and I will bring you back a full update um, if you so uh, approve me the opportunity to go. Mr. Benson. Well, I would move that the council approve that expenditure uh, for the mayor's trip to, uh, is it in Chicago? Chicago. Okay. The mayor's going to be a speaker. It, it gives him a chance to showcase uh, our community, get our community out uh, among other people in the nation in similar positions. Um, I believe in this kind of uh, expenditure where people get educated, they meet people from all over the United States who are in similar positions, and I think it's money well spent. Thank That's you. the motion. Uh, Mr. McEldowney. Second. I have a motion and a second. Mr. Amador, do you have anything to say before we call for the vote? I just want a second, Okay. but it won't come off. There we go. Mr. Bullock, you have discussion? Yes. Uh, I think this is going to be um, a feather in Commerce City's cap because it's going to show the collaborative effort between Denver and Commerce City 
that wasn't there four or five years ago. This is an effort that has been built since the mayor got back on council, and we probably have some of the best relations with all the communities that surround us than, we've, than we have ever had. So uh, I'm going to vote yes on this, and I think uh, this is one of the things that will really highlight our city. And uh, um, just before I call for the vote, I, I think it's important to say I've, um, my travel expenditures have been in the range of $1,300 for the year. Um, this is a two-night um, situation. It's very much like the Aurora uh, trip that Councilwoman Elliott went on. And uh, I do think it'll, it'll improve and continue to improve relationships uh, metro-wide. So with that, um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Mr. City Manager. Mr. Mayor, we did include on tonight's agenda under Administrative Council business an authorization for the mayor to sign a couple of letters in support of a GOCO initiative. Uh, those one letter was in the packet last week. We updated the packet today to include the other letter. Both letters are related to the same initiative. So if council is so inclined, authorizing the mayor's signature would be very much appreciated. And I'll ask for a motion on that in a second. I do want to point out that this travel request is just approved. Um, there are opportunities for two scholarships. Lisa is looking into those for me now, so hopefully that cost will be reduced. Um, with the opportunity for some scholarships, and it's, uh, it's two nights. All right, um, the opportunity to sign some letters, uh, I need to ask for a motion. Uh, Mr. Bullock? I move, I move to approve signing of the letters, but I will be discussing this um, after, if there's second. All right, <clears throat> Mr. McEldowney? Second. I have a motion and a second for the signature upon the two letters. Um, we'll go to discussion. Mr. Bullock. Yes, uh, I'm looking at both letters, and in both letters uh, I see that Adams County, City of Brighton, City of Commerce City, Rocky Mountain Bird Observatory, Bar Lake, uh, the R. Snow, and Duck Unlimited is in one letter. I also know partners are Elk, Sand Creek Regional Greenway, and the Friends of the Front Range so um, if we're going to actually put a letter out that establishes all the collaboration for all the partners, I think that we should put all the partners that are actually behind this because this is supposed to help youth with education and everything. And a lot of these show, but none of them actually show youth organizations like ELK or anything like that. So I think those should be included in the letters. Would you like to add that to your motion, Mr. Bullock? Uh, um, those additions? Yes. All right. And you want to state those additions again? Uh, the Friends of the Front Range, uh, Wildlife Refuges, Sand Creek Regional Greenway, uh, ELK, which is Environmental Learning um, for Kids. For kids. What else? Is that? That's it. Okay, that was it. All right, is that acceptable to the second? Yes. Okay. All right, I have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed aye. say nay. That was a very weak aye from everybody, but aye. it was unanimous. So um, that's approved. <clears throat> I want to get into reports. If there's no further uh, administrative council business. Oh, never mind. All right. So. Uh, We'll go to the city manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We did uh, distribute via email. Uh, Michelle Halstead sent it out tonight. This week's edition of the city manager report, fairly short. One uh, key item of note, next week's budget retreat is planned to start at 3 p.m. Our apologies. The uh, calendar outlook invite had not been updated, although we traditionally started early. Uh, we hadn't updated the calendar invite. So the plan is to start the budget retreat next week at 3 o'clock. We think we'll need all of that time and may go uh, uh, well into the evening because of the, the items to resolve before uh, the finance folks can assemble the final version of the budget for approval. So 3 o'clock with dinner, 5.30 or 6 uh, during, the, uh, during the meeting. It'll be here in council chambers 
on the floor as we've traditionally done in the past, but it uh, will be live on uh, Comcast and uh, Channel 8. All right. Thank so you. that's 3 o'clock next Monday. Next Monday, council, yes. All right. Anything more? All right. Mr. Turney. Uh, just to advise the council that uh, we have a DIA meeting this Wednesday at 2 o'clock at the Brighton Services Building, or Adams County Services Building in Brighton. Uh, this meeting will just be internally with the cities and the county. Denver will not be participating because uh, we got the issues with Denver resolved after last week's meeting. So this will just be an internal meeting with the cities and the county. Thank you. And uh, I'll be attending, and uh, I'll I be think there as well. the mayor and... Rick, Rick, Johnson I think is uh, going to go. Has a friend going into surgery, so he's he's going to he take that go. day off. Um, Brian, I would ask on that particular item. I know with Lisa being out and with Angelica moving to a different department, um, can you have have somebody update my calendar to show that meeting, please? Thank you. And the city manager, I'm assuming, are you going Wednesday? Okay. All right. That's all I have. Thanks, Bob. Um, I'm going to get into my report, and I do. I, I, I always allow the council to add anything to that report when I'm done. Um, I do have a few things I want to talk about that I think are important. Uh, first, I did attend the full Metro Mayor's Caucus a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we had a press release about um, trying to reduce homelessness. The program that the Metro Mayors have, have put forward, it's uh, tied to landlords, there's a $1,600 incentive to rent to homeless, homeless folks through the program. Um, and I know that they also have so much that they'll cover for any damages, things of that nature. So we're trying to encourage landlords to uh, participate in the program. I think it's a great opportunity for our police department when they um, address a homeless person in our community that they can call this number and um, be automatically get that person involved with this, with this potential help that's out there. And so instead of just saying, hey, you can't sleep on the bench anymore and having the concern of what to do, there is some resources out there. So, Chief, I would ask that you uh, follow up. I know um, Michelle Halstead can probably get you all of the information about how the program works. Um, I do know that we were uh, uh, – there are several communities that are, that are involved. Metro mayors, 42 different mayors across the metro area – and several have uh, participated in help funding um, this homelessness effort um, to, to reduce homelessness. I would ask that uh, um, Brian to have Michelle find out what the comparable um, contributions were from other cities so that we can consider a contribution to help with the effort. Um, after several pictures and, and days worth of uh, noticing Mayor, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Bullock was posting um, different homeless scenarios that, that residents were noticing up in Derby, um, that uh, there may be a need for us to um, be, a part, be, a, be a full participant of the program, and if so, I think it's uh, justifiable for a donation um, to the program. Right now, as of date, that date, um, the Metro mayors have raised over $50,000 through their communities to help with the effort to reduce homelessness, primarily for veterans. Um, but it's, it's everybody, but they have, they have a, a direct uh, veteran need involved. Um, then I did attend Rotary. Um, myself, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Bullock, and uh, Mr. Amador um, went to the Adams 14 back-to-school rally, and that's a rally that they hold every year, normally in the gymnasium over at the high school, um, to get their teachers that are returning and the new teachers to acclimate, to, to get them charged up about the school year starting, um, the importance of taking care of, of the kids and, and making sure that each kid matters as much as the other. Um, I was extremely impressed by their rally this year. I go every year and usually get up and give a speech. This year we were able to get them the opportunity, thanks to staff uh, here at the city, the opportunity to utilize um, Dick's Sporting Goods Park. So they held it in the stadium. Um, they had uh, Bill Nye, the science guy there, um, doing some. 
Steve, Steve Spangler. Steve Spangler, sorry. Thank you. Steve Spangler, and it was awesome. Um, he did some great things, talked about um, his experience as a teacher when he was with Cherry Creek School Districts, um, talked about how the interaction between teachers and the, the need to make sure that we're educating the kids. Um, it was probably out of all the years that I've been involved with the city, which has been a lot, um, that I've got to see such a, a, a motivation by District 14 um, to, get their, to get their teachers motivated. And matter of fact, it was such a big hit um, that the school district has now asked um, if we could help them to try to reserve another date at Dick's Sporting Goods Park so that they could have not only the teachers, but get all the student body for District 14 in the stadium and bring Steve Spangler back and help generate that, that uh, emotion um, with all of the, uh, the students as well as teachers. And I think it would be a great idea, um, but accolades to District 14. I asked them for some footage of the event um, to be able to show tonight a, a short clip. I didn't get that, but maybe uh, staff can reach out and get a, get a short clip so that we can show that in our uh, council meeting on the 21st. <clears throat> um, we had the uh, Rotary Golf Tournament, and of course, myself and Mayor, Tr Mayor Pro Tem Bullock are Rotarians, and, and the Chief, yes, thank you, and the Chief, and uh, the Rotary Golf Tournament was, was a success. I think it was a little bit lighter than last year. Um, but still, it's raising money for scholarships for students in District 14. So, uh, good event, and uh, thank you, Chief and, and Mr. Bullock, for participating um, on the city's behalf, along with me, um, to help make that a success. Uh, then, <clears throat> I did attend the Adams County Mayor's Lunch. The Adams County Mayor's Lunch is uh, something new. This was the second one of its kind. It's where all of the mayors in Adams County meet um, to talk about uh, relationship building and, and efforts to work with the county better. Um, so we had a presentation on the marijuana tax and the implement, Im, implement, imp, imp, implementation. No, not the implementation. The impacts um, by, uh, by this uh, new tax that Adams County, you know, they passed it on the ballot and now they're um, affecting uh, municipalities or home rule municipalities by adding this additional tax to businesses that they don't um, serve or contribute uh, any effort to um, that actually makes those businesses um, at risk for uh, non-competitive opportunity for the cities that are within Adams County and I was shocked at some of the the paperwork that that was handed out by North Glen and, and their attorney um, it's a substantial from what the tax was, and then once you overlay the new Adams County tax, um, it, it, it no doubt will have an effect on um, the, uh, uh, the opportunity for the businesses um, to be here from a competitive advantage. So we'll see where that goes. I know it's in, it's in court right now. Um, we'll, see, we'll see where it ends up. Um, but uh, it was shocking, and I'll make sure that I, I have brought extra, paper, extra documentation from Northland so that I can share with you. I just didn't bring it in here tonight, but I, I do have that. Um, and then the sec... Hmm? Right, yeah, maybe staff can get that from uh, 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 Northland's attorney through Northland and uh, get that out to the council so they can see what that... that uh, increase generates. Um, the next, uh, we talked about the jail cap and the concern that we've had over the years with the cap on the jail. When you hit that cap, you, you know, prisoners were getting released under uh, former Sheriff Doug Dar. Um, the cap, because of our agreement with the sheriff, has went from 60 up to 80, 65 to 80, right? 65 to 80. And uh, we talked to the sheriff. We had him there to, to talk with all the mayors about this cap, um, the cost of, of bed space once we go above the cap, um, how do we get to not having a cap. Uh, a few of the things that came out of that is, number one, I didn't realize there are 12 pods at the jail. Um, currently, there are like, I, I, if I re recall right, he said, 
um, like eight pods are fully outfitted and ready to go. They just need manpower. The other four pods were um, minor things necessary to bring them up to speed, which was like, like bed coverings and things of that nature. Um, currently, they're using five pods. So there are several ready to go. And, I, you know, the question was, when do we go open up another pod? How do we go to, and, and realizing we just were able to get the increase in the uh, limit the, the, to 80, um, when do we go to a zero cap? And the sheriff uh, told all the mayors at the time, he was, he was very um, open and, and agreed he'd like to get to a zero cap, no, not have a cap at all type of scenario. Um, there is some, some decisions about, you know, money about financing that other pod for employment. Um, he's working, I think, very well with the commissioners. Um, but I, I, I want to give credit to Sheriff Mike McIntosh for the agreement to get that cap up to 80 now um, so that we're not put back in the position that we were. Um, I did ask him to reach out to Judge Juarez and talk to him about his his uh, mentality of, of running the jail and the cap rate um, because I know Judge Juarez was pretty elevated over over how this was being handled and he told me that he'd reach out to him um, that he had just talked with the judge in Westminster and all of the mayors are on the same page when it comes to um, this this tax that Adams County is trying to implement and the cap rate on the jails um, so I just thought to give you an update and, and every Every two months, we're going to have these meetings ongoing, and it's really just a collaborative effort to work as cities to be more of partners with the county instead of competing with the county. And I think it'll be very beneficial um, to Adams County over the long term, especially to the municipalities, um, to have one voice when trying to approach the county. Uh, again, uh, Rotary. Um, as Bob said, we just had an ACC meeting last week. Um, we do have another one this Wednesday. I did attend that as well as uh, Rick and Bob. And then uh, I, I already mentioned I went to the South Adams County Water District Board meeting to ask for that participation. Um, and then I wanted to talk about the neighborhood outreach real quick. Um, Crystal did mention that uh, it was designed a little different because now we have Paradise Island. Um, we have a little less room. I have to tell you, staff did a great job of laying that out. Um, it felt closer, uh, more engaging to the community. I really enjoyed it. And, you know, I noticed that we get, at least I get, fewer complaints than I did when I was the mayor um, several years ago. Eight now, I think, when I, when I was the mayor before. But um, it, was, it was really interesting because... I'm walking through the crowd and I'm talking to people and I stopped off at the wildlife table and one of the wildlife officers from the Division of Wildlife said, hey, I need to talk to you. I got this real problem with trains and I know you guys did that quiet crossing up on 96th and Highway 2 and he said, it's great. We need one by us. And I said, okay, where's that at? He says, well, I live off of uh, 80th and Olive and the tracks there at um, Monaco and 80th Avenue, um, the train is out of control. They honk and, you know, it's very disturbing and we really need this quiet crossing. And I was able to explain to him that that particular area is unincorporated Adams County. And then I refer him to the commissioners um, that I, I understand his problem. We dealt with Eagle Creek and uh, it, it's refreshing that... A lot of the complaints that I do receive aren't within the city's jurisdiction. They're outside of the city's jurisdiction, where before it seemed the opposite. And so I, that goes out to accolades to the staff for jumping on top of these issues and trying to get them dealt with. Um, you heard me earlier talk about the chip seal debacle that was last year and the mess that we all went through. Um, I don't even know if people are noticing that the chip seal is being laid down. A majority of it's done. And it's, it's great. Everybody is loving it. I have not had anybody call and complain about tar or anything else. That, again, is accolades to our staff for trying to get out in front of these complaints. 
Um, I just passed on a complaint to the chief the other day. The gentleman lives in Adams County, but we're still trying to help him out because part of the roadway um, is, is Commerce City. But um, it, it's interesting that the majority of the complaints that we're receiving, now I do get some from Commerce City residents, and I pass those on to staff to deal with, and they're getting dealt with. But um, strangely enough, a lot of a lot of complaints about Adams County, and I, I think that goes to show that Commerce City's really stepping up. And I give that credit to the council that I work with and the staff um, for implementing what this council moves forward on to try to improve that quality of life for our residents. So thank you to the council and thank you to the staff um, for those efforts. Uh, that's the extent of my report. Wait a minute. Tell who played with you at golf. Huh? Who played oh, with and you? Mr. Bullock wants me to tell you who played um, golf with me that day uh, at the Rotary Golf Tournament, and it wasn't Renee. Nope. Renee actually uh, worked. It was uh, me and um, Councilman Douglas, uh, Councilman Teeter, and the chief. Oh, what? Jim Hayes, I'm sorry, it wasn't the chief. I wished it would have been. He's got a monster swing on that drive. But we still, we still did all right because we came in seventh place, and it just happened to work out for us that they were taken care of and acknowledging first, second, and third, seventh and tenth, I believe, or twelfth. Seventh and tenth or twelfth. So anyway, um, we were able to, to get a little gift certificate for the clubhouse, and seventh place didn't didn't result in much. I don't remember how many foursomes were at the tournament, do you? I think it was 40-some. Uh, uh, 38. 38. 38 foursomes. So seventh wasn't bad. I have to tell you, though, if we would have had the drive from the, the chief, we would have been up there in the top three. There's no doubt about it. So, um, um, I see, chief, I was dreaming that you played golf with me. So it, it was all, all really good. The last couple of weeks have been good. Um, I just want to keep uh, the Commerce City motivation moving forward. Um, to add to my report, Mr. Benson? Yes. Um, E-470 last week. Um, the executive director, John McCuskey, announced his retirement at the end of the year. So if any of you are interested in pl applying for about $190,000 uh, annual salary job to manage a 47-mile toll road, Get your resumes in. Steve, are you? I mean, it's a good, but you need to know something about Roger. Bonding. Refunding bonds. Hey, whoa, whoa, don't get rid of our employees. Well, we need to have a good man in there. But You're going off council, Jim. You're going off council, why don't you apply? I don't have the background in finance. That's, that's you can fake it till you make it. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't, I'm too old to fake it like that anymore. All right. All right, next is uh, Councilwoman Carson. Um, I just wanted to give a big kudos to the Cultural Council. They completed their Music in the Park series. Uh, and, and I was there. Had, thank you, Mayor. Thank you for coming. Um, they had some of the largest turnouts they've ever had. Um, the last one was at South Lawn. The, one of the food trucks actually sold out. Um, we completed a fundraiser at Chipotle. So uh, there are actually two openings on Cultural Council. So anybody out there listening, if you would like to come join this highly energetic committee and, and help bring some of these things to the city, please get on the city's website and you can get the information on there and actually fill out an application. But thank you, Cultural Council, and thanks to everyone who attended and supported it. Thank you. Thank you. And you know, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm surprised I missed that one because um, that was, I had to plan that because there was like four things going that night. And uh, I made it a point to get to that because um, I wanted to be at that event. And I know Rick was trying to cover for me. Yeah, we had the um, candidate uh, piece that was going on here. Um, and, and as well as some of the um, uh, recreation center uh, programming um, opportunities through the uh, rec center in Bell Creek. So thanks for bringing that one up, uh, J.D. And then I got to add one more. 
Adams County Fair. Thank you to the commissioners for sending over some tickets. Thanks to council members that helped donate to my kids some tickets. Um, I did go over with uh, Mr. Bullock. We engaged with some of the commissioners and the sheriff uh, while we were there. Um, went over and watched the uh, bull riding event. So uh, we did take advantage and, and participate in some uh, regionalism with Adams County um, over the last couple of weeks as well. Councilwoman Elliott. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just wanted to mention, I went to a, uh, actually I was invited to a uh, culinary event at Adams City High School. It's called the Pro Start Program, and it's the first of its kind uh, within this particular area, metro area. And so uh, I was actually really intrigued, um, obviously because of a little bit of my background with the baking of pastry, but uh, the fact that the school district really wants to build a sense of community and so this is in the very early stages. I mean, I just went to this event last week. I actually have a meeting scheduled with uh, Superintendent Pat Sanchez. Uh, but my, my dream or my vision is to actually reach out to um, School District 27J because I know that they have a culinary program, but maybe not to the magnitude of, of what Adam City High School has uh, or is trying to, to uh, uh, build. But... Um, this is something that I think would really help our districts unite as one. Uh, I'm one person. I'm going to ask for council's support once we get a little further into the discussions. But uh, the uh, two instructors there at, uh, at Adams City High School were very uh, thrilled, to say the least. We had a discussion that led probably two hours after the event had ended. And so we're planning to meet um, on a continual basis and see what, what type of program we can create from this particular Pro Start, Pro Start program. And this is sponsored by the um, National Restaurant Association um, Educational Foundation. So uh, I think what, what the plans are is to open up the bistro, Bubba's Bistro, to the community and be able to offer, uh, you know, maybe lunch or dinner uh, opportunities that the kids create the menus and, and uh, prepare the food. But, uh, it's, you know, it's, it, again, it's in the preliminary stages, but I, de I definitely feel that this is something that we could bring our community together, both school districts, and uh, just stay tuned. Thank you. Mr. Douglas. Uh, yes, I just wanted to add to the um, report. Last week I was able to attend one of the recreation um, studies as far as talks and what the vision is for the new rec center in the northern area. Um, so I want to tell the citizens thank you for the ones that showed up. And then tomorrow <clears throat> there's an older adult senior citizens uh, of, um, committee that's going on, I mean not committee, but a programming for the new rec center as well. And then later on in the evening there's a Spanish speaking residents. Uh, they want their input on the new rec center as well for our programming. And then tomorrow night Ken Vinsel's uh, uh, ceremony for the as being the new chief of uh, fire fire chief. Thanks. Great, thanks, Steve. Um, anyone else have anything else to add before I uh, close this meeting out? Seeing no one, um, if there be no further business to come before the city council this evening, we're adjourned. Thank you all for being here. To say the least, we had a discussion that led probably two hours after the event had ended, and so we're planning to meet um, on a continual basis and see what, what type of